All righty, well, here we go. And a good morning, everybody. How's it going this morning, everybody? How y'all doing? Hello, good morning. Uh, getting, getting it going today. Hope you all are having a good start uh, to your day. And uh, yeah, here we are. It is, what is it, the 22nd, I think, right? Yeah, 22nd. All right, well, hi, everybody. Good morning. My name is Jared. Uh, you probably best know me from tomorrow, a uh, Space Flight show here on YouTube and other things, and uh, so glad to have all of you aboard today. So um, first things first, I'm going to check in um, with this here and see if we can see if I've got the chat up and running correctly or not. Um, and it does not look like the chat is working for me this morning, so I will just have to say um, good morning to everybody as is. Um, so jumping in the chat, hello Mac, good morning, and uh, happy to see you all here today. Um, and of course, if you're here, you know, jump in, say hello. We do a roll call, you know, with at as always, um, and just kind of kind of work with it as I uh, throw the links out onto social media and just kind of kind of throw it at everybody. Um, don't know what we're going to talk about today. There's a whole bunch of stuff to talk about today. There's been a lot over the past couple of weeks. It has been wild and out of control in some uh, some respects, <laughs> some respects in some areas, um, and some people have been very very mad. Um, but luckily, not many of consequence, I guess, as I would describe it. Uh, with that there, so yeah, so some really good stuff. Uh, hi, Loopy. Good morning. Yeah, it's pretty quiet. This is a little earlier than I usually do. Um, do my streams at so it is it is what it is i wanted to start early on today so we're kind of kind of still figuring out where i'm going to do it at um but yeah it is or the day is young um and of course we'll be it will be going as long as i feel like going um so that's the nice bit um about this is that i'll just i'll do what i want so yeah <laughs> <coughs> As I go this morning, so yeah, very good stuff. So yeah, glad to have everybody here who is here at the moment. So um, it's working out pretty well. I can see some of you were here beforehand, but now you aren't. Um, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just joshing with you. It's fine. Do you do you, and we'll uh, we'll make that happen uh, at some point at least. Um, but I will remember this. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. So you know, I was really hoping to have chat integration, uh, but it looks like we'll have to wait for the next one. Uh, to do that but the nice thing is um that hopefully it's not going to be too long a distance to the next one so um yeah so we're gonna try to start doing these a little bit more often a little bit more frequently as we hang out uh this morning and let me just go ahead and just fire off on twitter you know hey everybody uh ama is up and rolling come inside and join us all all one of us so something like that so and then I'll probably fire off some tweets to set up yeah AMA is up a rolling in case you're wondering how good my grammar is grammar is this morning um, really good stuff um, also hopefully you don't mind <clears throat> um, but I did wake up a little bit late this morning um, so I do have breakfast uh, with me here, like a full breakfast, um, as you can see here. Let's put that somewhere right there. I have bacon, eggs, toast, so everything, everything the body needs, apparently. So, um, so hopefully you don't mind me eating. We should just, let's have breakfast together. So here we are. Also... Um, I went to Basic Bitch HQ uh, because I am definitely part of that Starbucks, so I'm fully loaded, double fisted this morning. I got my green tea frap and my black tea, venti black tea. Uh, thank you once again, Dada, uh, for bringing on the black tea. All the caffeine, none of the sugar. Oh, it's such good stuff. I love it. <clears throat> All right, so I don't know where to start, honestly, but of course, uh, I just want to thank my mom for this. Uh, this morning super good stuff um always love your mama thank you mama so i believe in, i believe mr t rules on that very much believe in mr t's rules 
about love your mama, you know, other things like that. So, <clears throat> so. and uh, Mac, you missed my garage? Well, don't, you won't have to miss it much longer. Here it is. <laughs> um, don't worry, though, I will be shooting news um, later today. So uh, that will be, that is coming. Uh, don't worry, the, the news that was supposed to be shot a month ago will be shot a month later, so, uh, but it's getting shot, so that's at least, that's at least a positive with that there. So, yeah, don't worry, it's coming. I'm working on it, including my own, my own YouTube stuff on this channel here. Um, will be coming, restarting in September, I finally have some time uh, to make things happen. So I've kind of, there's some, some things I've gotten rid of and other things, uh, yeah, I've just basically just pushed it out, pushed things out of, out of my way that were getting in my way. So the only problem is I want a like cohesive start date. So September 1st, um, is the, is the one <clears throat> that I will be, uh, doing that with. So should be a lot of fun. Um, really looking forward to getting back into my own stuff along with tomorrow stuff too um, just because we're we're I, I would say six weeks away now from tomorrow returning um, so yeah in case you didn't know live shows for tomorrow are supposed to be returning um, around October 8th sometime around there um, so we'll have to see we'll see uh, kind of what happens with that um, and I'm, I'm very excited for stuff like that to finally be returning and hopefully you are too because it has been a very long time uh, with that there. So, um, well, Mac asking, is this a Jared only AMAA? Ask me almost anything. And Mac, I loved your tweet this morning about what you thought <laughs> AMAA was. Um, that's very much, I could see my dad saying something similar to what you were thinking. Um, so you're asking, is this a Jared only AMA or tomorrow as well? Well, guess what? <clears throat> Ask me almost anything. So um, you're most certainly welcome to ask me almost anything. Um, as long as it doesn't violate any of the like NDAs or stuff that I'm under, you, you, we can talk about it. So um, so again, I'm, an op I'm a wide open book, not just on the internet, on Twitter, where I can sort of um, parse what I'm going to say and figure out how I want to skirt around questions. Um, here, you put me on the spot, and I'll actually answer things as, uh, as uh, honestly as possible, because that's the way this works. So, if you got any questions, go for it. <clears throat> but I will say, for my own channel here, I'm going to be returning with some things. <clears throat> So it's all up there, the astronomy show. Going to be hitting back on September 1st. So very excited about that. And it's Wednesday. Um, that might bounce around because I'm just trying to figure out what's a good day uh, for this to come on. Um, I remember when I like first started, it's all up there. Um, I think a couple of people were like, you, you uploaded this on the same day as this popular YouTuber. You know, and I'm just like, are you com you're, like complaining about more content? Okay. Um, Oh gosh, not more stuff for me to enjoy. Um, but um, yeah, so Wednesday kind of sounds good to me. It's like the middle of the week. It's hump day. You know, it works out pretty well. Um, STS is still going to be on Saturdays. So that'll be back on September 4th. Um, so I'm very excited um, about that. Going to be, I finally have a bunch of people lined up who want to actually come in. Um, also, it's starting to look like, too, with that, that I'm not necessarily just going to be sticking here to the garage. I'll actually go to people as well um, and kind of talk to them in situ, wherever they happen to be. Um, then I've got my super secret project, which I don't want to say anything about it because I don't want anybody to latch on to it and take it and run with it. Because um, I'm trying to do something really, really cool. Um, if you're in the chat and you know about the super secret project... Um, you can say whether it's cool or not, um, you know, kind of however you feel um, about it. Uh, but that will be launching on September 6th, that Monday, Labor Day here in the United States, um, where we celebrate 
labor and all the things uh, unions have gotten us, so good stuff. Um, as a union member myself at one of my jobs, thank you, thank you unions, y'all kick ass. Um, then of course we have uh, Head, which is sort of like the periodic editorial where I talk about whatever I want to talk about. Um, that one's pretty cool. Um, I've been working, kind of trying to figure out an episode of how to talk about um, my own journey through my mental health and other things like that, being bipolar type one um, with uh, severe psychotic mania. So, <laughs> so some really fun stuff um, with that. I'm, uh, so I've been working on that um, to kind of work with my mental health stuff um, with that. Um, and then um, this one's, I, I'm not really gonna be saying it too much on the down low, I guess, anymore because I'm about to say it out loud. Um, but um, I am uh, working on a project right now uh, to talk about um, uh, the F-117 Nighthawk. So this is sort of a, like a passion project I've had for a very long time. Um, because like, uh, like a couple months ago, I was just joking uh, with my partner. I was like, you know, if anybody ever made a movie about the F-117 Nighthawk, it has to have... Um, you know, synth wave as the as the music for it. Like it, that's the only acceptable acceptable music for it. Like it has to be, um, it has to be the exact same music that you would expect to see wireframe, you know, computer designs with and things like that. Um, and then the joke kind of uh, was no longer a joke, and I wanted to actually make it happen. So, um, so I'm contacting people right now about trying to get uh, as much footage as I can. Um, I don't know if you have ever read the book Skunk Works by Ben Rich, who ran Skunk Works. Um, it is a fantastic book that shows you exactly what it was like um, inside of Skunk Works um, during Ben Rich's time there. Ben Rich, a very uh, amazing aerospace engineer, um, with the work that he did at uh, Lockheed at Skunk Works. Um, I mean, literally, like, an inside view of what it was like to work on the SR-71 and the F-117 Nighthawk and other things like that. I mean, like, like, like fully black projects um, here. And it's just, it was so, it's so cool that he was able to write that and finally publish that and let you know what it was like to work on that. Um, so I'm going to be grabbing that, picking that up again and kind of going through that, rereading that um, and using that a little bit. Um, and um, I've sort of, I've joked around about having um, like an alternate channel to this one of my own so that I can use music that I like um, to make videos that I want to without having to worry about copyright strikes because I do want to monetize this channel um, because if I can monetize this channel then that means I can you know push one of my jobs to the side uh, that job knows which job it is um, and it should and it should feel very bad for itself um, and uh, and start to focus solely on this channel and starting to bring things up um, with it here so um, yeah so that would be very very cool um, with that there and then adventure um, just really can't do adventure in a pandemic you know it's kind of hard to just like go places and show up and do random things um, because uh, unlike it seems like a lot of people in the United States right now I'm uh, a, you know, I kind of, I kind of understand the science um, behind the current COVID stuff, um, and uh, seems like, you know, it's a problem, and like we really shouldn't be going out and around. Um, but you know, you gotta, you gotta apparently keep the uh, the economic line happy and sacrifice grandma. Um, and also, as it appears to be now, sacrifice children as well um, to make that happen. So, um, yeah. So, boy, am I glad to be living in California because we're, you know, we're, it's, there's a surge, but it sure ain't like, you know, Texas or Florida, which is it's just terrible seeing that happen to those places. I really do mean that. It's, it absolutely sucks watching the uh, leadership in those areas just completely work it so anyways boy yeah but that's none of my business um so um so mac of course yeah if you're going to start with something um <clears throat> if we're going to start with something the elephant in the room and the most important question of us all is the mohawk coming back um yes it is uh i don't know what kind of mohawk it's going to be on return though so yeah I don't really know, uh, but it will return, um, and I it will be waiting till the end of the year at least. 
Um, so I'm going to just let my hair grow out. Uh, this is actually the longest I've ever had my hair. Um, I've always had short hair, um, even when I was a little kid. Uh, and the, so, so every second that this grows, it's getting, it's the longest it's ever been. Um, and as you just saw as well, um, which I'm definitely, I'm not a person who's like ashamed to admit this. You can see there's a little bit of a problem there if I'm going to be doing a mohawk. So, you know, uh, yeah. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not one of these people who, I'm not one of these men who feels like their hair defines their masculinity or other things like that. Um, um, I, I leave that to my muscles that I obviously, look, look at these, look at these derringers. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I'm not, I'm definitely not one of these. I'm going to, I'm going to put some Rogaine on or, or I'm going to have hair from my ass transplanted to my head. Um, because that just seems very silly, um, to me. <laughs> Cause I just like, I, I'm not that invested in my hair, I guess. Um, or I'm not that invested in trying to grasp on to, to things that are not, you know, I don't want to say not important to me, but just like, I don't know, like I'm just as comfortable with a shaved head as I am with a mohawk as I am with this. Um, it's just, it'd be nice to have enough hair, um, to pull off a mohawk. So there's some, so I have some options. Um, so one of them is that, you know, obviously the front, you know, this kind of front, uh, half of my head is not really cooperating and growing hair back, but the rest of it is. Um, so I've got really thick, really thick strip of hair, all the way up to about right here on my head. Um, so I may just end up doing that. Um, just turn that into the mohawk right there. Um, and I mean, is it not there in that front bit? Yeah, but also like it's punk. So punk is whatever you make of it. Punk's not dead and punk is whatever you make of it. Um, no one, <clears throat> No one can tell anyone what punk is. Um, so punk is what you make of it and just roll with it. So that's one, that's one thing uh, that you want to do. Uh, or one thing I might do. Um, another is that I do, you know, I do have a full, you know, full head in the back. And I thought, you know, this was something I actually did before I got, uh, before I shaved my head back in April um, to kind of rebuild the mohawk, which then, you know, destroyed it. Um, apparently, uh, which is that this back portion, you know, back in this area right here, I've got like a full head of hair here uh, still. So I was thinking about maybe just doing the mohawk back here in the back, um, which I call the speed tail uh, after the, uh, the uh, Porsche, Porsche 917s uh, and the McLaren speed tail. So I'll talk a little bit of Le Mans, uh, since I wanted to talk a little bit about Le Mans uh, today. Uh, that's right, you know, here you represent, right? Uh, Got the right there. only sports, uh, only sports class car to ever win Le Mans. So uh, very, very in my favorite uh, livery too, with the the Apple computers uh, livery with it there. So pretty cool. Also, you know, it's just like you know, it's it's got the same colors as like the Pride stuff. So if it can if it can be queer as hell, I'm for it. So um, yeah, totally. So it's like it's like it's like triple. It's like a, it's like quadruple references just in a single shirt. Um, so, so that's one thing. So it's the speed tail idea with it. Um, and then another, which I was, again, once again, joking around with my partner um, about it. Uh, um, and uh, it was, uh, I said, I said, you know, it, I should just do, I should do a reverse mohawk, you know, where basically you shave your head on the inside and then you use the hair on the outside go up with it, you know, kind of like, you know, kind of like that, you know, with it. So, you know, um, <clears throat> and I was just like, that'd be funny, wouldn't it? Like, that'd be really, really funny. Um, like, that'd be so entertaining if that happened. Um, my partner was like, well, why not? Like, you should, like, you should do it. I was like, what the hell? That'd be cool. Um, so that would be really, really cool. Um, and, uh, and I started thinking about it. And I was like, yeah, that would be really cool. So I don't know if you guys... Um, so I'm a, so I love music, big music person. Um, so my music library is like, I think I've almost got, I want to say almost 25,000 songs on Spotify. I've literally got like several months worth of music in my Spotify <laughs> library. Um, I just love music. I love it from all over genres. Um, so the prodigy 
if you ever heard of the Prodigy, um, their band, uh, sort of like Big Beat, uh, uh, I don't want to call them trip hop or anything like that. I don't know. Somebody in the chat wants to correct me on their genre. Feel free to do so. Um, but uh, their lead, their former lead singer uh, Keith Flint had a reverse mohawk. Um, so if you ever if you ever watch their music video for Firestarter, their song Firestarter, I'm the Firestarter, Twisted Firestarter, um, which really speaks to me as someone who works with rockets and things. Um, <laughs> he uh, he has that perfect like a perfect reverse mohawk in that um, in that. Um, so if I were to do the reverse mohawk, that's probably one of those where I would have to ask work first. Um, so both of my jobs are actually totally okay with me having a regular mohawk. Um, in fact, one of my jobs, um, my boss constantly cites my mohawk as, as the fact that, you know, space is for everybody. Um, I mean, we even have a guy who has a mohawk, you know, um, with it. Don't worry, Colt, you're fine. It's okay. It's okay. You're, you're good. We all tried staying up for the mall, so don't worry. It's fine. We'll get it next time. So you're good. You're, you're fine. So um, I love you, Colt. Uh, so, um, and uh, yeah, we'll see. We'll see if I can make the reverse mohawk um, work with that. So, um, all right, cool. So uh, hair transplant to ensure the mohawk totally justified. You know, Aaron, I kind of agree with that. Um, oh yeah, Mac, I have the same problem. I just deny it <laughs> with regards to hair with the, yeah, I know, right? Oh boy. You know, I shaved my head to help the hair grow back, but it seems like when I shaved my head, some of the hair was like, oh, that's our cue to stop growing. Um, so good job. Good job, biology. So I just hate biology. Um, so yeah. Oh, Aaron, you talking about the reverse mohawk? Maybe. I mean, I don't know. I'll have to see. I have to clear. That is one that I would absolutely have to clear first, I would imagine, because that's a, that's a significantly harder, um, much more edge kind of, kind of thing to it. Um, yeah, but yeah, Aaron, I, I, I really like the reverse mohawk look. Um, I don't, I, you know, it's, it's really tough. Um, cause if I'm going to do it, it's gotta be like Keith Flint. Um, cause Keith just had like an excellent reverse mo like, like, like this is exactly how you should have that. Um, so I'm trying to figure out how to get away with that. Um, and how to make that happen. The hard part is that, like, in order to, like, figure these things out, you have to mess with your hair to do it, which means that you then have to, like, you know, <laughs> if you do something wrong, you got to wait a couple, <laughs> a couple months um, and live with the shame, I guess is how I would describe it. But, yeah, it's pretty good. Um, so good stuff. Um, yeah, Aaron, California is a paradise in many ways. You're not wrong. It's pretty good. I... I quite appreciate a state government that actually understands science and follows the science of things. So who knew? Who knew that would actually help you out as a state? Um, so sort of. There, I, you know, I, I don't feel like anybody's doing enough. Um, honestly, if, if you ask my honest opinion about what, sh what sh we should be doing, just lock everything down for like six weeks, pay everybody for six weeks to stay locked down, and we're good. We should be good at that point. Um, but that's just, uh, you know, that's just me. I'm not, I am not an epidemiologist. I just listen to them. So, um, so that's my, that's just my, that's my opinion on it, which by the way, perfect time for me to just say real quick, um, that the views and opinions expressed in today's live stream do not reflect those of my employers. The views and opinions expressed in this live stream are mine, mine alone and better than yours. So, jumping back into the comments that we have right here. Uh, Waterston says, I know that you have an NDA for things I can only assume are space-related. Um, actually, no. I have a few other NDAs that are not necessarily space-related things, but I mean, you know, I've seen some cool things of late from maybe some upcoming things that you'll be able to watch. And also maybe some things that are, you'll be driving. So, I've just... I'll, I'll just say I'm an avid Jeeper, and uh, Jeep does take notice of these things when you talk about it quite often in other places. Um, 
So, uh, so Warston, if you have like a question about rockets or something like that, feel free to ask. If I can't answer it, I'm just gonna say I can't answer that. So, and it's no big deal. Um, I've got zero problems with people asking me questions where I end up having to say basically like I can't answer that, uh, because then I might be able to figure out actually a way to, to kind of work within within that and maybe see if I can roundabout answer it. Basically, ask it. If I can't answer it, I won't. Um, if I can't answer it, I'll try to figure out a way that I can without making things too perilous, I guess, for myself. Um, but also, if it's just like straight up, like, <laughs> like what's the proprietary mix of this, this, and this? Then it's like, well, no, I can't tell you that. Uh, but just ask. Um, and you asked, uh, do you have any comments about Tesla's AI Day presentation? Uh, you know, I haven't watched it yet. Um, I, so I think it's really cool. Um, I, I've always been very, uh, very uh, forward on robots and things like that. I think robots are, are really good. Um, and um, I'm, I'm sort of, I don't want to say hesitant about artificial intelligence, but I'm, it's definitely on my mind when I think about things like, like we need to make sure that when we do, do have artificial intelligence that we, that we have I don't know if I want to say like benevolence built into it, but we need to make sure that this artificial intelligence isn't gonna isn't gonna skynet us. Um, but of course, that's also how artificial intelligence is portrayed in fiction. And is is fiction how things are actually going to occur? Well, probably not. Um, the I know a lot of people say that that uh, uh, you know. Um, fact is stranger than fiction or, or fiction inspires fact or other things like that um, but also in some sense of of that uh, not really as somebody who who before switching over to engineering was very deeply involved in in filmmaking and and storytelling and, and other things literally to the point of just getting a degree in this before I switched over to engineering um, there's there are you. You have. To, there has to be some kind of fantastical aspect of certain things in order to make fiction work. Um, simply because that's just the way it is. Um, regardless of how accurate you want your fiction to be, you still have to bring on a fantastical point of view in order to make it work. So, um, so I'm, I think those robots are really cool. Um, it's really difficult to make a humanoid robot. Um, although, um, you know, you've seen Honda spend. Hey, 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 sir. Sorry, there was a there was a bug uh, right there. <laughs> um, so you've seen Honda spend God like how many decades trying to get a humanoid robot with Osimo or whatever it was called, um, and then like Boston Dynamics just came out of nowhere and did it in like five years. So what's up? I'm eating. Yes, I'm eating. So I'm, I am. Look at this. Oh no, I'm good. Thank you. So, I'll wait till I'm done. Thank you. Um, but yeah, um, I think it's really cool. The ideas are there. Um, Tesla has the talent, definitely, in its talent pool. Um, and if they can pull it off, that'd be really, really great. Uh, cause there's a lot of repetitive jobs that, that robots well, robots do repetitive jobs better overall. Uh, and, uh, yeah. I think it's really cool. And I hope that they get it. Um, I don't think... Did he... I don't think he mentioned a timeline, if I recall correctly. Um, or if he did, you know, it's Elon, so just ignore it. <laughs> uh, with it there, so... Yeah, but great. Really cool question. Um, I don't know about you all, but I'm... <clears throat> I'm very, like transhuman positive on things i'm very much about like screw this meat bag i mean just would you would you no no that's my drink not yours no stop shoo 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 shoo, shoo. So you all are seen <laughs> this is riveting content this morning so yeah just some good stuff this this fly is like this i wonder if this fly has a starbucks card honestly so it's, hey, hey, you got me some Starbucks this morning. So maybe if I, if I aim my fans correctly. I've got some fans out here just to get some air in here with it. So <laughs> with that. Um, <clears throat> um, but, 
Yeah, I'm definitely one of these people who would be like, remove me from this body and upload me to a chassis, you know? I'm just totally ready to get out of this absolute garbage. Look at this thing. It just doesn't work all that well. I mean, like, half-jokingly, I'll often say, like, the sinus alone is worth becoming a robot. Because then you don't have to deal with sinuses ever again. Um, but also, like, no... That sucks. Sinuses are terrible. Like, they're awful. Like, it's just bad. It sucks a lot. So I'm very much, uh, I know I've got a friend of mine who I've talked about with this before who's very much like, um, oh, I'd like to just, you know, I'll be a cyborg. Like, I'll have parts, you know, but I still want, like, physical pieces of me. But I'm just, I'm just like, yeah, just build a carbon fiber chassis uh, and just upload me to it and make it happen so um and then it was really great too i had another uh co-worker who was like but if you were uploaded into the into the robot would that actually be you like would you would it still really be you or would you end with your physical self and then it's like a brand new you in the robot and my answer to that was i don't give a f you know just just do it you know upload me as long as there's like some sort of continuity for myself then let's do this like what are we waiting for so um, so if anybody out there needs a volunteer to make it happen, how's it going? Um, I will, I will definitely give it a roll. Um, just because that's, that's how I am. And, uh, I'm just, I'm, I'm tired of this, I'm tired of my sinuses. Um, I'm tired of my, if any of you have been following me on Twitter, um, you know that, uh, that about five months ago, I started having issues with, uh, my hip, which ended up being, uh, a muscle in my butt, uh, called the piriformis, pir piriformis, pir something like that. Um, but I, I now have what's called piriformis syndrome, which is basically where the piriformis muscle <clears throat> is either, um, uh, it is interacting with my sciatic nerve, um, because in most people that, that muscle and the sciatic nerve, they're not really near each other. They kind of go around. Um, but in some people, the sciatic nerve goes right through the muscle. And then when the muscle, you know, moves, it, or it has to flex, you know, it, it, it um, what do you call it, uh, contracts and relaxes, um, which then means that it acts on the nerve and it makes it hurt. Um, so I'm dealing with that right now. And you have to basically, like, do exercises to strengthen that muscle specifically, to target it. Um, they are excruciatingly painful, and I've been having to do that for about three months now. Um, and the progress is very slow. Um, and... It cost me my entire climbing season this year. I had to stop. I, I, I did one trip uh, to Mount Baden Powell this year, and then only made it uh, um, a, about a third of the way up on that. Um, and I mostly went because I wanted to kind of be there for friends and stuff, kind of support them as they were going up in their training. Um, but yeah, I had to I had to miss a lot of my precious um, precious climbing that I like to do. Um, well, not a lot, all of it uh, for this year. So, um, so yeah, uh, get me, get me out of this. How many times do I have to tell you, Mr. Fly, or Miss Fly, or excuse me, Fly, leave. Nobody wants you here. Leave. So, gosh. So, uh, man, what a bug. What an absolute pest. So. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I just, I can't, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, Orsten, I don't recommend it. I do not recommend, uh, 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 having your piriformis muscle or piriformis, whatever your, the muscle in your butt, um, go bad. So, um, yeah, so it's it, human body is stupid and I, it, it always blows my mind about like creationism and stuff where people are like, like it was perfectly made and then you know, it's the, the grand designer. And I'm just like, hello, hello, no, not very good, actually. I C minus at best. So I always think about Robin Williams um, when he talks about putting the amusement park. <laughs> Robin Williams, when he talks about putting the amusement park right next to the sanitation, you know, plant. So <laughs> the drop. Oh, gotcha. Okay, don't come back. Don't come back. Don't come back. Don't come back. You got a taste of my hand. Next time it's going to be a taste of something to flatten you. So, all right. So I'm, 
I'm gonna go ahead and just close the garage door. Maybe that'll help a little bit. Also, you know what? Probably eating my breakfast will help a little bit too. Here, so. Uh, yeah, the fly can identify how it wishes, absolutely. That's a good point, uh, Ryan. I agree with that, 100%. So, I don't, I don't uh, disagree with that at all. Uh, actually, how about I just push this to air and see if that actually makes it to air? Because um, the chat just finally popped in for me and actually started working. Um, it works! I think it works! I can see it on my end here. I think it works. I think it works. Okay, you tell me in the comments, did it work? Did it work? I think it works. Of course, this is gonna take like a minute <laughs> to confirm if it does work. Oh, Colton, you, you sneaky little dog, you. You're so good, I love you, Colton. Yes, 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 I love you, Colton. I love you. Colton, I love you. I love you. You're amazing. Colton, you're an, you're an amazing human being. So, it's good stuff. All right. We're finally with it here. All right, so now I can finally throw things uh, up onto here. Okay. Um, yeah, Aaron, actually, that's a really cool, uh, really neat point, which is I've been reading and thinking there were nine species of humans living beside another as recently as 15,000 years ago. Um, we have some of their DNA, but they're gone. Maybe AI is the next step. Yeah, possibly. I mean, uh, technological evolution. So technology, I would imagine, is, is an important part of evolution uh, of a species, especially once you get technology in that species um, with it. So yeah, it, it may just be a natural progression on how it goes. Um, as well so um there's also some really interesting things too with like simulation hypotheses and um and ai and, and other things like that but that's that's another level um i'm not <laughs> i'm not gonna <laughs> wade into that minefield um today uh we could do it at another time um but yeah and, yeah um yeah, and uh, many are cautious about AI, but the next step might very well be transhumans. Then we go quietly into the night, and our work in the universe is done. And I don't feel like just because, um, just because we would go transhuman means that humanity is over. Um, <clears throat> I would argue that that humanity sticks around for as long as um, as long as things it has created or here so i mean i would say humanity sticks around as long as the shoot as long as the pioneer and voyager spacecraft exist for so um yeah yeah so it looks like a lot of you are pretty excited um uh about the idea of doing that so pretty cool yeah <laughs> yeah yeah ryan it is uh it is pretty funny so gobble gobble turkeys Turkeys, turkeys, what smoky turkeys? I don't understand the uh, the turkeys uh, thing. So, all right, I'm gonna have some toast or some jam. Mmm. I hope you all are having a hope you all are having a delightful day. Happy day to all of you. <clears throat> Except for everyone at uh, Glickenhaus Scuderia Ferrari. So. I like having this, this chair here to let me kind of swing around a little bit here this morning. So yeah, we just saw Le Mans. Uh, not gonna spoil it, except uh, Suck it, Glicken House. Nobody likes you. So, <laughs> so that's <laughs> so yeah. That's that's my opinion about them. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's pretty funny. 
I'm not a not a fan. Not a fan. Uh, yeah, that's a really good point um, about that, Ryan. Uh, quick spoilers uh, for the 24-hour Le Mans. Uh, some cars went around a big track for a couple of hours, which is very true. It's a big track. Anybody else? Anybody else having breakfast? Or whatever you're having? Roll call, what we eating? I got bacon, eggs, and toast. And double fishing from Basic Bitch HQ this morning. Starbucks. <clears throat> Thanks, Mom, for breakfast. Mr. T Rules. Always love your mama. Colton, gonna pick up some McDonald's. McDonald's. It's pretty cool. Uh, ocean, Greek yogurt, and chai. Would you like to try the tea? It's got chai. So, <laughs> dang. Oh my goodness. Colton, that's a steal. Call the police. It's been, that's a steal. $1 10 piece McNuggets and a $6. Double cheeseburger, two double cheeseburgers for six dollars and a fry basket. Ah, Ryan says it smells like a classic British roast dinner is in the oven downstairs. Ryan, I do not know what a classic British roast dinner is, so feel free to expand on that. I actually have a like pub near my house, um, but I don't know if it's like actually. I don't know if I would call it uh, authentic. So, Mac, you got lunch on the East Coast. Um, well, Mac, what are you having? So, <laughs> or what do you think you're going to have? Um, also, Mac, hopefully you're not in the way of uh, Henry, Hurricane Henry, over there. And if you are, get the get the hell out. Ooh! Yeah, Colton. I can never say... Um, I cannot... Uh, yeah, I can't, I can't say no to Nuggets either. I got a f funny story about Nuggets if you want to hear it. Um... <laughs> it is related to being at a furry convention, too. Uh, Warriston, about to have meatloaf. You live in Europe, so that's cool. I love a good meatloaf. Um, really good stuff. So, and hello. Good morning. And by the way, good morning, everybody. Um, all over the world today, so very cool, as always. Um, <clears throat> oh, cool. Sick stuff. Uh, Mac, leftover steak from last night's pool card. Pool, excuse me. Leftover steak from last night's pool party. Nice. That's good stuff. Yeah, Mac, I think I saw the photo of, I think I, I think we just sent in those photos of uh, 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 Comet Neowise uh, last year. That was from your backyard, and you have a really cool backyard, in case you wanted to know. So I would definitely have a pool party there. So, okay. Okay. Uh, okay, Ryan, so, so a classic British roast dinner is roasted meat, which is either beef or chicken or lamb or pork, um, with potatoes and Yorkshire pudding and vegetables. So here's the something else. What's Yorkshire pudding? I don't know what Yorkshire pudding is. Um, and also, Ryan, you, have a, you make a very good point, which is that there are no real pubs outside the UK. No, I agree. Um, that's you know, pub. Um, so I cannot speak to the authenticity of the food there. I suppose we would have to take you there and then have you try everything. This is a green tea frap. This is pretty good. Really like them. I usually get it without the whipped cream. So there's two to three grams less of sugar. Batter in a tray. Okay, so this is Yorkshire pudding. This batter in a tray thingy, and you cook it or something. I don't know. I've never made them. So green milk, no, Smokey. No, I wish that this was green milk, but yeah. I'd have to go to Disneyland for that. And uh, guess what I'm not doing? Going to Disneyland anytime soon. 
that's a big hell no for me. So, um, yeah, that's just a like a viral load uh, or a viral powerhouse. It's waiting to happen. Also, um, can't afford it presently as well. Um, yeah. So the nice thing about having an annual pass was I could just go whenever I wanted. And I did. And I went all the time. If you followed me on Twitter, you were seeing I was probably doing, you know, you know two or three times a week uh, right before the pandemic started. So, but, you know, is what it is. I'll get back to it. Um, <clears throat> uh, what is it? <sighs> Google it. Okay, I'll Google Yorkshire. Was it Yorkshire pudding? Oh, it's also probably Yorkshire. I don't know. Wow, can I type this morning? It's the English side dish. Yeah, bear with my internet here. The fact that I'm streaming right now is putting a great strain on the my internet's existence. In fact, I'm probably sucking all the bandwidth from everywhere in my neighborhood because this is the United States, so we think it's okay for one provider to provide all of the bandwidth uh, because that's called competition. And we totally believe in that here in the United States. Okay, so it's part of a traditional Sunday roast. Okay, so you're having a Sunday roast. Okay, so Yorkshire pudding is a common English side dish, a baked pudding made from a batter of eggs, flour, and milk or water. It is a versatile food that can be served in numerous ways depending on the choice of ingredients. The size of the pudding and the accompanying components of the dish. So basically, it looks like really cool biscuits. So, or really good biscuits. What? Oh my gosh. On Wikipedia, there's a photo of some Yorkshire pudding filled with mashed potatoes, beef, gravy, and vegetables. So you could use it like a, like a bread bowl. Oh, I'm so here for this. Yorkshire pudding is meant to rise, by the way. So, wow. You, okay, so first of all, didn't know. <laughs> I did not know that you, that y'all in England had a Royal Society of Chemistry. <laughs> and that they actually put out a standard that says that a Yorkshire pudding isn't a Yorkshire pudding if it is less than four inches or 10 centimeters tall. So it's got to rise at least 10 centimeters. Wow. Uh, oh, there was a poll done in 2012 that says Yorkshire pudding was ranked 10th in a list of things people love about Britain. Okay, so I guess it's very well done. Yeah. 1737 was a recipe for it. Oh, it's used in a dripping pan. Ooh. Okay, I know what that is. Actually, that sounds really tasty. So, I'll have to, I'll have to try some. So, uh, yeah, you certainly do have a royal society for everything. Um, you have a standard for tea? We have a standard for tea. Okay, I need to know... Or should I just Google the standards for tea and now we can continue my, Jared's education of, of England or Britain or um, whatever. I, I'm really sorry. I don't know what to call. I don't know where to go. <laughs> sorry, I'm American. So, <laughs> yeah, Miko won. Very, very appropriate. Come for the space chat. Stay for the Yorkshire puddings. Uh, we're, it's, again, you know, it's a whole mixed bag. We're going to talk about whatever you, whatever we want to talk about today. That's that's half of the fun uh, with this. Um, Orsten asking, uh, can you name some of your favorite science YouTubers? Always looking for new content to watch. Um, so, obviously, I really love Scott Manley uh, with the work that he does. Uh, uh, oh, my God. I knew this was going to happen. Somebody was going to... 
ask me, and then I was going to completely forget about folks. This is his name, so I'm sorry. Let me look up some folks um, that I have. Uh, Sophia Guy Nassar, she is a fantastic, fantastic cosmologist. Does some really cool stuff uh, on YouTube. So check her out uh, with her stuff. She's a dark matter hunter, so she's uh, she's she's just fantastic at everything she does um, with it there. Uh, who else? Cal Hill. Uh, Kyle Hill's very good. I enjoy him. He's very very funny. Um, I'm I'm much more about science people being funny than being like overtly technical and other things like that. Um, I've always said if I had a chance to make my own like actual budgeted science show, it would basically be like Cosmos, like the wonder and amazement of the universe like you get in Cosmos, um, but also with like the absolute total irreverence and uh, stunts of jackass. So, um, so that would literally be, um, I would be my, my, my own personal science show, uh, Cosmos and Jackass uh, mixed together. Uh, and, and a lot of that comes from the fact that I uh, watched Jackass growing up and I still do watch Jackass. And actually I will go see Jackass forever. Um, and I will have seen, I, assuming that's the last one, I will have seen all the Jackass movies when they were in theater. So cool stuff. I don't know why it always like surprises people I was like, you like jackass? I was like, yes. I'm like, you know, engineers actually are people. Every once in a while, we's people. So, so that's very true with that there. So, uh, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Yes, yeah, so that's, that's what I got. <laughs> Royal Society for everything. That's still pretty funny um, with it. So, I'm going to look it up now. Uh, I'm just going to put in British... T standard. Wow! There is a standard! What in the hell? And it has an actual technical number, too. BS6008. Since 1980. Method for the preparation of a liquid of tea for use in sensory tests. There's also, <laughs> get this, the International Organization for Standardization also has a standard method for brewing tea. ISO, three, ISO 3103. Um, oh, there was a revision uh, to the, the, uh, the uh, BS 6008 in December of 2019. So that's what started all of this, the revision. Um, what? Ah, okay. I get this here. Gotcha. Um, oh, actually, this can speak to something uh, very interestingly. All right, let's just run through it uh, really quickly here. Um, the pot should be white porcelain or glazed earth earthenware and have a partially serrated edge. It should have a lid that fits loosely inside the pot. If a large pot is used, it should hold a maximum of 310 milliliters plus minus eight and must weigh 200 grams plus minus 10. If a small pot is used, it should hold a maximum of 150 milliliters plus minus four and must weigh 118 grams plus minus 10. Two grams of tea measured to plus minus 2% accuracy per 100 milliliter of boiling water is placed into the pot. Freshly boiling water is poured into the pot with to within four to six millimeters of the brim. Allow 20 seconds for the water to cool. The water should be similar to the drinking water where the tea will be consumed. Brewing time is six minutes. The brewed tea is then poured into a white porcelain or glazed earthenware bowl. If a large bowl is used, it must have a capacity of 380 milliliters and weigh 200 grams plus minus 20. If a small bowl is used, it must have a capacity of 200 milliliters and weigh 105 grams plus minus 20. If the test involves milk, then it is added to the bowl before pouring the infused tea into it. Okay, unless that is contrary to the organization's normal practice. So that would be opposite of what I do. 
when I add milk to tea. Um, if milk is added after the pouring of the tea, the standard notes that best results are obtained when the liquid is between 60 to 80 degrees Celsius. Five milligrams of milk for the large bowl, which is definitely not what I do, um, or 2.5 <laughs> milliliters for the small bowl is used. Holy smokes. Um... <laughs> So the protocol has been criticized for omitting any mention of pre-warming the pot, uh, and Ireland was the only country to object and objected on technical grounds. Uh, so this is, by the way, this is not meant to define a proper method for brewing tea intended for general consumption, but rather to document a tea brewing procedure where meaningful sensory comparisons can be made. So basically testing, taste testing, and other things like that. Um, so here's the thing I want to talk about with this, because this brings up actually a really interesting thing um, that I actually really don't like, which is that the work was the winner of the 1999 Ig Nobel Prize, or Ig Nobel Prize, excuse me. Um, so in case you don't know what it is, the Ig Nobel, or Ig Nobel, I don't you know, um, I'm American. Jesus died for me to mispronounce things. Um, it's a satirical prize that is awarded annually since 1991 to celebrate unusual, it celebrates 10 unusual or trivial achievements in scientific research. Um, it's stated aim being to honor achievements that first make people laugh and then make them think. Um, so here's the problem. I don't really care for it uh, because you can often highlight actually really good research and make it seem like idiots are doing this and that they're doing this for a really dumb reason. Um, and that's not really great in terms of like publicly interacting uh, or public interaction in terms of STEM fields and other things like that. Um, it's, it's very much reminds me, we have a senator, I can't remember his name here in the United States, um, who every year puts out a, a diatribe, excuse me, document um, uh, that basically is him targeting uh, National Science Foundation research that he thinks is wasteful. Um, so, um, and it's, it would be something like checking tea to figure out chemical things like that. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's very, it, fe it just feels counterproductive to kind of what we're trying to do. Um, just not a big, not a big fan um, with it. So, yeah. Uh, oh, <laughs> well, you know, I got to say this. Uh, Miko One says, I am British, but was unaware of the T standard. Well, now you know. So this is why you need to watch my live Ask Me Almost Anythings, because you learn things. It's not just like, it's not just, hey, you know, I'm, I'm doing this, you know. You're, we're actually like, you're learning. We're not just hanging out. You're learning, right? So... Yeah, we're learning. We're all learning today. Yeah. What's, how's the Jurassic 5 song go? If we... Uh, we know something you don't know, and if we don't share, then we don't grow. So, there you go. That's it. So, uh... Okay, so, Mac... Mac, you're saying, uh, I've been stuck for the last three years replicating your video about why we send telescopes into space. Are there any videos that you have been working on for forever that are unfinished? Um, Mac, if you could clarify that a little bit. Uh, just I just need a little more clarification on that. Um, I don't know if you're asking me about like a video, like am I like a like a tel space telescope video I'm working on or something like that. Um, cause I have my, I have my, uh, my ever wanted, ever longing to make my Starlink, uh, versus ground-based astronomy video, um, at some point, because somebody's got to make Reddit mad and I'm up for the task. Um, even though I said I'm being nicer to Reddit these days, I've still am allowed to make them mad, um, with that. So, uh, you know, Oh, that's a really cool one, uh, Aaron. 
Uh, that's a really, actually, uh, if people are willing to pay for these 8 to 45 minute trips to suborbital space, I'm curious about high altitude flights, like a solar electric propeller version of Pearland 2. What do you think? Um, so just by the way, Pearland 2 was, uh, if, I remember, if I recall correctly, um, set the record for highest glider flight. Um, God, it was really high up too. Uh, what was it? Yeah, it was something like 52,000 feet. Holy smokes, that's really high up. So, yeah. Oh, actually, excuse me, they went even higher. The next year, they went even higher. They went to... <whistles> wow, they went to 60, 76,000 feet. Oh, how did you get in here? How did you get in here? So, wow. 76,000 feet. Jeez. Jeez. <laughs> All right, I should eat. Um, I would totally do that. I think it's really cool. And as you mentioned there, as you mentioned, Aaron, it is quieter, safer, and certainly a lot cheaper. Don't sit on my drink. You never know what could happen. Um, I would love to do that. That would be amazing. That'd be really cool. And there's, I would imagine, there's science that you could do at those altitudes too that it would be very silly to even fly it on a suborbital flight. So love to make that happen um i also really like the balloons the high altitude balloons idea really like those I, who was it oh i can't remember the name of the company but they were talking about doing that and they had ron garen uh an astronaut as one of their folks who was working on it oh, what was their name i can't remember but yeah i would totally do that i'd jump in I still want to ride on Spaceship Two. So, so Sir Richard, hook me up. Ready to fly, man. Just ring me up. I'm. I want to go. So. Yeah, I guess the answer to that question early, who would I fly on, Blue or Virgin? I'm going Virgin. Better experience just watching the videos of the flights so first of all big fan of the x-15 spaceship 2 is basically in slower x-15 but it's aimed for height aimed for altitude not for not for velocity so um so i like the idea of being on something that like somebody's actually piloting so that adds like a this is a little extra thrill to it um it just looks like a much better experience it looks like the cabin inside spaceship 2 is tremendously bigger than inside of New Shep Blue Origins New Shepard. So shoo, shoo fly. Um and also Blue Origin. Um Yeah, I don't really I don't really know how to say it other than uh this fly, you know, flying around, annoying me, pestering me. It's unfortunately what Blue Origins kinda of turned into over these past couple months, hasn't it? So, which is a real shame. I was just kind of talking about this with coworkers the other day, which is that, you know, like, like eight months ago, if you were talking about Blue Origin, you were talking about them, like, having, maybe having issues with their BE-4 engine, but overall, they were still, like, this really cool competitor to SpaceX that had a really cool idea, which was that, you know, moving, moving the economy off of moving some of the economy that we have here on earth off of this planet and elsewhere um, for the benefit of all, all humankind that we have here um, but now it just seems like Blue Origin has just become sort of like this slush fund for lawyers and it really sucks and I hate it so um, yeah just not a fan Any, and it sucks too because I've got lots of friends that work at Blue um, and a lot of them have basically said to me 
um, that what Blue Origin has been doing recently is not reflective of how they feel. Um, I could tell you, having been involved in aerospace for over a decade now, there's really no animosity in the aerospace industry, honestly. Um, everyone wants everyone to succeed in their own respective ways. Um, when someone fails, when one of us fails, all of us take notice because it could be a problem that ends up affecting everybody. Um, so when SpaceX, uh, you know, when they lost CRS-7 and then they lost AMOS-6, those were two very big things because it was like, oh crap, like, you know, this, you know, this is, Falcon 9 is not the only Carolox rocket, so what happened? Like, we need to understand why this happened so that way other Carolox rockets don't have this issue. Um, and really, there's, I, there's nobody in aerospace, nobody in aerospace is rooting for anyone else to fail. Except it now seems like Blue Origin is doing that. Or Blue, let me rephrase that. No one in aerospace wants anyone to fail. But it seems like Blue Origin's PR department sure is trying to reverse that trend. Because um, I'm confident that this is the PR department. That this isn't, this is not people that actually, this is not the engineers of Blue. This is not the senior management of Blue. This is the PR department and whoever's running the PR department and whoever may be calling the shots. Um, because this focus on opponents and other groups uh, was not there many months ago. Blue was heads down working. Blue has always sort of been that heads down working kind of company. So I have no idea what could have possibly happened in the recent couple of months that would have changed Blue's attitude. I have no clue whatsoever. I just, I don't know what could have possibly done that. So... <laughs> Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, actually, Smokescale, uh, you want to say that you saw a report that Blue Origin lost a bunch of engineers and designers recently? Yes, um, a double-digit number of senior engineers and managers, uh, both from their engineering divisions, their financial divisions, their business divisions, their management divisions, uh, basically up and left. So I don't, so I don't want to phrase it as bleeding talent, um, but, yeah, yeah, let me tell you, <laughs> it's been a lot of high-profile people leaving Blue Origin recently, which you would think, after a successful New Shepard flight with people, it wouldn't do that. So, um, yes, Miko One, where's my engines, Jeff? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, very true. Where are those engines? Um, yeah, I gotta say, uh, I definitely agree with you there, Colt. The second I seen them call out Virgin's one loss, I quit Blue Origin that second, just no. Competition I get going that far though. Yeah, um, yeah, it's my channel, I can phrase it however I want. That was horseshit. So, um, it was horseshit, that was very disrespectful. Um, that was beyond a low blow. So, and yeah, that was definitely, that was definitely a turning point for me too, where I was just like, you know what? Like, ugh. yeah. Uh. Yeah, actually, uh, Mac, you pick up a good point, which is companies suing each other is general, every, is general everyday practice that is a culture they brought with them from Silicon Valley. Uh, very true. Um, it's also not. Um, it's also not. Uh, so it's not uncommon in aerospace for lawsuits to occur as well. Um, but also, Mac, you just basically you made the point that I was just basically going to say, uh, which is that I am one of the people who also questions the wisdom of suing your only customer. Um, yeah, I mean. These are things that, like, you know, you're not really supposed to, like, remember down the road, right? No. People will remember this. Um, I was just saying the other day, um, 
the right people in the right positions are going to remember this for a very long time. So, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So, it's a mess. I wish them well. Good luck in whatever you're doing now. Uh, because, boy, it sure ain't what you were doing when you were chugging along, you know, even six months ago. Um, and it sucks. And I hate to see it. It's like watching your best friend... Um, it's like watching your best friend like going through the throes of some sort of bender and like you've got to you're on the verge of having to come in and do an intervention to make them stop that's really what it feels like it feels like we have feels like blue origin needs an intervention at this point so and it, it just sucks because like nobody nobody want I, I mean this is something I say a lot because it's true. Nobody wants anybody to fail. Like we all want everybody to succeed. When we all, when one does well, we all do well. And it's just ridiculous watching this happen. And it's so frustrating and stupid. And I hate it. I hate it. just as much as I hate that fly. Um, so, so yeah. Uh, okay, kind of going back a little bit here. Mac, you asked me uh, that you're talking about unfinished videos. So are there any unfinished videos um, that I have? Yes. Actually, there is a tomorrow video uh, that I have that is unfinished. Um, and that is a video about why it's so dang hard to land on Mars. So as you can imagine, we wanted that video to be ready uh, around the time that Perseverance landed. Um, it did not happen uh, because uh, I, was, I was coming off of COVID um, and cancer at that time. <laughs> at that time two minor things um in my life at that moment and it kind of got put on the back burner uh, for a little bit there but i would like to kind of bring it back around um pretty soon um with that um but yeah i was going to do a very i have a very detailed uh presentation that i'll give um when i go out and do public talks about space flight if somebody requests it about why it's so dang hard to land on mars um it's it's really difficult um, and there's very good reasons for it, and I love talking about those reasons. Um, so yes, that's a video that's in the works. Like I said, wanted it in February, but yeah, my my health kind of comes my health kind of comes first. And I know that you're not like implying it's not or anything, but just you know, it's it's our it's really our policy at tomorrow, um, which is very nice. I always appreciate that from from Jamie, which is that health family anything comes first before the show um things that need to be handled have should be handled so like the show can wait i guess is a, a good way to describe it so and we were allowed that and that is a deeply appreciated attitude because man that's not an attitude that that you find everywhere i can tell you that so uh, from one of my jobs, yeah, I can tell you that. That was a, that was a fun one, where my dad's in the hospital and I'm like, I gotta go. And my boss said, if you go now, you're gonna be in trouble. And I said, fire me and left. So, yeah, they didn't. This was almost this was almost ten years ago too. This wasn't recent. I wasn't like, this wasn't when my dad passed a couple years ago or two years ago almost two years ago now um that happened that was a that was a it was an extended period of time so that was at least uh yeah that wasn't sudden like the his first hospitalization was so uh, yeah it always seems like we um we sing the praises called jamie is great with that so many ups and downs for me that jamie has been like listen take care of it then come back yeah same thing with me i had to take some time off uh really kind of gather myself this year um especially with you know the like my double whammy of of covid and cancer at the same time that kind of yikes that was kind of a it's kind of scary um so yeah there's some good there's some good times but yeah overall i gotta say just some amazing people to work with so it is an honor and a privilege to get to work with Jamie, Carrie Ann, Dada, uh, and uh, also other folks uh, that I've worked with as well, like Lisa, Jade, Athena, 
Manju, Sarah, um, Mike, and other people. It's it was a it's an absolute honor to work with uh, folks, uh, even folks who are no longer with us. It was it's still I'm still like in awe of just how amazing um, amazing we've been and um, just like how great everybody is to work with. It's it's thoroughly enjoyed and I really love it. Um, and as I've said, tomorrow saved my life. So um, it really felt like it gave me purpose in a time in my life when I was really hunting for that. Um, and I'm, I, you know, I remember, um, uh, like in one of the Space News episodes, I said during our Patreon thing, I said something to, similar to that. I was like, you know, thank you for all of your support. You know, like we, it means a tremendous amount to us, and I really mean it. Tomorrow saved my life, and and you all putting your faith in us to help us and contributing to us to make this happen is amazing. And I remember somebody in the comments was like, "Whoa, it's so melodramatic." talking so fake talking about it saved your life and just like like piss off it did so like i was you know it's like you don't know the 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 dark times that i was going through and and how tomorrow was something to look forward to every damn week um or tomorrow is something that still even is something to look forward to every damn week even though we may not be doing it weekly it is still something that i'm just like completely entirely committed to so uh, yeah, so there's some really fun stuff. So, uh, oh yeah, Mac. Uh, thanks for coming in, Mac. Uh, great to see you. Uh, you can email Jamie uh, if you want to do any if you want to do anything for that. Uh, Jamie's very receptive um, to to helping us out. So find find Jamie's uh, tomorrow email and uh, email her, and uh, she'll uh, she'll get back to you and uh, let you know. So and that kind of goes for anybody. If you if you have anything you can contribute, um, we're definitely open. Uh, to making that happen. So, uh, but thank you, Mac. Good to see you. Uh, just quick roll call. Uh, who's here? Who's watching? I want to say hi to you this morning, um, or this afternoon, or this evening, or this night, or early morning, wherever you may happen to be. So, see you, Mac. Have a good one. Um, so, all right, Colton. Good to see you, Colton. Uh, if you don't come back, just in case. Uh, but yeah, just quick roll call. So, we could say, I could say hello to some folks and also continue to stuff my face with breakfast. <laughs> Christian! <laughs> oh, Christian, you're killing me. <laughs> Cheap piece of crap. I love it. Good morning, Christian. Good morning, Smokey. Smokey is here. F turfs. I agree. F turfs. Trans rights are human rights. Jared said trans rights. Ocean, good morning. Yes, I'll say hello to you again. If I've already said hello to you, you can you may receive another hello. But good morning. Hello everybody. Yep, Christian that a cheap piece of crap is a great name. I gotta say, I definitely, I'm remembering it. That's for sure. Well, we've hit the bottom of this well. Anybody else? Anybody else wanting to say hello this morning? I mean, at least getting your, getting the hello on today, so. We all just kind of hang out. Oh. Uh. Anything y'all want to talk about? So we're an hour and a half in. I don't know how long I'll go for today. Well, we'll figure it out. Just kind of watching the chat. Looking at y'all. Staring deep into your soul. deep very deep so oh it's a good one Smokey I'm definitely a big fan of this who do you tend to root for when watching Formula One uh, so when it comes to Formula One 
I'm very much a fan of of the sport itself. Uh, oh, so oh, so first and foremost, I am a fan of Formula One. Um, I am. I just think it's a it's a fantastic racing series. I love it. I love everything where it's like here's the formula. Everybody kind of makes their own vehicles. We go with it. Um, <laughs> unless you're Aston Martin, then you just get some Mercedes vehicles. Um, but uh, I would say some of the so so the folks that I root for. Um, so here's a fun one. Um, so so my favorite driver is Lewis Hamilton, um, and I know a lot of people would probably boo me. Um, if, if I had a studio audience, people would be booing right now. Um, but I have been watching Formula One since the mid-90s. So Formula One is not something that I just, like, jumped in five years ago and said, who's the best driver, and then, like, stuck with it. Um, no. I've been watching since the mid-90s. And I also don't just watch Formula One. I also watch Formula Two as well. I pay attention to these things. So back when it was GP2, and I was watching with Michael Schumacher getting ready to retire and everything, everybody was kind of like, well, I guess we need to figure out who's like who's the next up and coming that you should kind of keep your eyes on. You had Fernando Alonso at the time, you had Kimi Raikkonen, you had a whole bunch of other folks um, kind of sitting um, in that area there. Felipe Massa, I mean, like Alonso, Raikkonen, Massa, like, Gosh, what a what an incredible group of talent, um, just in that area alone. Um, uh, along with, also, I've seen Rubens Barrichello as well, and Jensen Button um, in that era. Very, it was just a very diverse era of, of pretty good drivers. Um, and uh, yeah, I just remember watching Lewis Hamilton dominate uh, GP two in two thousand six, as uh, as uh, Schumacher was on his way out, and Alonso was right, was winning his second World Drivers Championship. Um, and I remember telling my uncle, I was like, you, like, if Lewis makes the jump to Formula One, that's the person to keep your eye on. Um, and I made a very good call <laughs> on that. So, yes, yeah, so that was really, really, uh, really fun um, with that, watching Lewis uh, grow up. And I think one of the things I like, so one of the things I like most about Lewis isn't necessarily the fact that he's such a good driver, but the fact that he has really matured very well, um, really matured a lot. Um, as a competitor and as a driver as well. So there's, there's been, you can see the growth um, from when he was, I don't want to necessarily say just a kid, um, you know, when he first came in 2007, but there's definitely, like, you could definitely tell the Lewis of today is no, no, really isn't recognizable compared to the Lewis of 2007. So um, and that's really great with that. Um, I also... Get this, I also like Max Verstappen as well. So I'm a big fan. He's aggressive and I like that. Um, and <laughs> so this is gonna be really funny uh, saying this considering recent things, um, but I was really enjoying this season so far because of how well Max and Lewis were respecting each other as drivers um, and kind of, um, kind of basically deciding instead of being hard nosed and and not nice to each other, that they're going to actually race. Like, like I'm going to race you. I'm going to give you a run for your money, and we're going to see who's the best at this. Um, until uh, Silverstone, depending upon who you talk to, um, which, as far as I'm concerned, Silverstone uh, racing is racing. That happens. Um, and then Hungary, where Botas, the Botas torpedo, um, with that there. So that's kind of the way it goes. Uh, but yeah, um, also, um, yeah, I pretty much, I mean, it's really, I like everybody except for Nikita Mazepin. But of course, it's really easy to not like Nikita Mazepin. He sucks. He's not a good driver. His dad bought the team, bought his team for him to get in there. And I know that you could also say, well, Lance Stroll's dad bought his team to get him in there. And he did, but at least Lance can drive a Formula One car most of the time. No offense to any of my Canadian friends um, on that one. Um, but, you know, it's just the way it goes. Um, and, yeah, I really, I just really enjoy the sport. Um, and then uh, Ricardo as well, Daniel Ricardo, always cracks me up um, anytime he's talking about anything. Um, and I absolutely... He's, he's hilarious. So he reminds me a lot of Eddie Irvine. Um, and uh, <laughs> Eddie kind of run in his mouth as often as he did, but Ricardo's a bit more, how would I describe it? Um, reasonable. 
reasonable. Um, yeah, I guess that's all I'll throw it in there. But yeah. So uh, long. I'm a very much a long time McLaren fan. Um, I very much enjoyed watching McLaren and Ferrari battle it out um, in the late '90s and the aughts. Um, with that, there uh, Mika Hakkinen and, and Schumacher trading barbs with each other on the track, which is absolutely amazing um, during that time period. Um, and then Raikkonen also coming up through McLaren and just becoming dominant in that respect and then sneaking in at Ferrari and winning that World Drivers Championship in 2007. I guess the 2007 and 2008 were absolutely nuts um, because of that. So uh, 2009, too, because of Braun just, like, just showing up and just zipping everybody. So it's pretty cool. But, um, yeah, you'd be, you'd be very hard-pressed to find me not liking – anyone from Formula One, except for Nikita Mazepin. And then, you know, as has been said, it's not hard to dislike him. So, he's bad. <laughs> to put it mildly. Like, you don't put you don't put videos of, you don't assault women. At all. Period. Much less put your video of you doing that on Instagram. Just, you fucking moron. Like, I don't, I don't care what the... There is no excuse for those kinds of things. So, whatever. So there goes, like, there goes like all of my Russian viewers. All five of them or something. Um, oh, okay. So, sorry. I just... I have an app that tells me when earthquakes uh, happen locally and just had a couple pop off. Itty bitties is a 1.5 and a 1.2, so you're not going to feel that. Even if you're on top of it, you're not going to feel it. So... Um, so, but yeah, it's just cool. I like this app because it just reminds me that, you know, one day my house is going to be a little more to the northwest than it was 60 seconds ago. So, <laughs> so <laughs> like 30, 35 feet, something like that. <laughs> it's sort of like a thing... Um, actually, I'll, I'll go ahead and say this on air. Um, I actually do have um, a, a sort of like general phobia of uh, the dark. So, um, so I know that's something that a lot of people probably aren't willing to admit to having, but I'm actually a little bit afraid of the dark. Um, and that comes from the fact that almost every, uh, every major earthquake I have, I have been in has occurred at night. Um, so... It's, there's, I want to call it like an overarching unease at nighttime. Um, but yeah, every big earthquake I've been in has occurred in the, in, in, at night. So that's kind of where my fear of the dark kind of comes from a little bit, um, is that. Um, so I don't know if anybody watching has ever been in an earthquake before. Um, it's, it's something else. Um, I always tell people, so earthquakes fascinate me. Um, if I wasn't, so in science, if I wasn't doing engineering, I would absolutely be in seismology. Um, it's such a fascinating science. And I find it so interesting. And, uh, um, um, and it's just growing up in Los Angeles and growing up in a very seismically active place like Los Angeles. Um, uh, I don't want to say you get used to it. Um, because the frequency of earthquakes is still at the point where it does take you by surprise. Um, and also that's just the nature of an earthquake too. It's not like a hurricane where you can kind of predict its, tr its track, how much strength it's going to get or other things like that. It's not like a tornado where you can pull it up on Doppler radar and you, you can have like a 10, 15 minute warning, get in your, get in your basement or cellar or whatever. Um, I'm in LA, we don't have basements. So I, I assume that's where you put that. Um, uh, and uh, uh, with an earthquake, there is no warning. It starts, and then it starts building up. And you don't know how big it's going to get either. Um, so it starts, and then you're just along for the ride. It, it's, it's happening. Here we go. How big is this one going to get, I guess is the way to, the way to say it. Um, and the last earthquake that we had uh, that I felt here in Los Angeles was actually relatively close, close to my house. Um, so it was, it was a good one um, to the point that, that I had a couple of books and stuff fall off of my shelf. And I haven't been in something that potent um, in quite a while. Um, 
Um, but yeah, it's it, it can also it's, it's very humbling too, realizing that you know I'm living on basically a geological etch a sketch, um, <laughs> and at some point, um, at some point, we're gonna have a very bad day, and, and we're gonna get uh, some pretty big shaking for two to three minutes at a time. So. Um, whenever, whenever the San Andreas finally ruptures and, and lets itself go, so um, yeah, so um, which I'm I'm prepared for, and uh, frankly, I would rather deal uh, with a, a sizable earthquake every ten to fifteen years uh, than I would with a hurricane uh, season every uh, every year. Um, <laughs> I'd rather rebuild my house every 20 years than, than every, every fall, I guess is how I would say it. So a small price to pay to live in an amazing place like here. Um, so yeah. Also, another cool thing is that here in Los Angeles, we've been having earthquakes for a very long time. They've been wrecking buildings for a very long time. So, we've ha so we, have, um, we have building codes and laws and other things that have been in place for a very long time. Um, so my house was built in the 50s, but it's still able, it was still built to withstand earthquakes um, because during that time there were still codes and laws that said you had to do that. Um, because here in Los Angeles, since basically the, uh, uh, the 1910s, they've had codes and laws in place that are basically saying you have to build for an earthquake. And after every earthquake, we learn something new to so add to those codes and laws and you have to renovate or add on things or do something with your house that allows you to continue to do that. Um, so I'm pretty, I'm pretty confident um, that whenever the big one does happen, house will still be standing. Um, probably will need repairs, obviously, but you know, it'll uh, it'll still be here. So, smash cut to me underneath an entire house, dead. Um, so, <laughs> so yeah. So we'll see that. So, um, okay. Now that I'm done talking, now that I'm done talking about earthquakes. <laughs> oh yeah, Smokey. Uh, good one there, which is that uh, clearly the earth is waiting until you're asleep to have some sweet rave party for rocks. Yeah, I can tell you it's uh, it's something else, you know, once, once the motion's going, <laughs> you're on the dance floor. I'm on the dance floor of this fault line. So thanks, Aaron. Good to see you. Uh, have a good one. Enjoy some sleep or enjoy some work, whatever you got. Uh, Johnny Cheese. Hi, Jared. Hey everybody, what did I miss so far? Um, a few things. You can go back and rewatch at some point, but I'm just going to continue to go on. Uh, Kai Fox is here. I am become here destroyer of dispositions. Very nice. Uh, and then Leland Rogers, hello. Good morning, afternoon, evening, or night to you. Saying, hey Jared, you have probably already answered this, and I did, but what made you decide to ditch the Mohawk? Uh, so good question, as always. Uh, it's something that I will I will have to contend with until my mohawk eventually returns. Um, but I uh, I did not ditch the mohawk. I did uh, a bit of maintenance. Um, so a mohawk haircut is kind of a bit uh, puts a lot of stress on your hair and your scalp. So you have to let your hair dial itself back um, a little bit. And uh, the, there's some ways you can do that. You just basically stop. Um, and then kind of work with things. Or uh, you can do what I did, which is just shave your head and let it grow out completely new and other things like that. So the Mohawk will be returning. Um, I have said, however, that I am going to let my hair grow out till the end of the year. And that's mostly just for my own curiosity. Um, I have never had my hair this long before. Um, it's always been short. Um, so every single second, my hair is growing longer. So every single second, my hair is the longest it's ever been in my life. Um, and I just want to grow it. I just you know, grow it a little bit. Grow it for, what, four, four more months or so? Um, and we'll see what happens. See what it looks like then. And then at that point, I'll make a decision. Um, as I was showing off earlier uh, today, because I am, uh, my, because um, my identity and masculinity or whatever you want to call it is not tied to my hair, um, as you can see, uh, male pattern baldness has set in uh, on my delightful self at the age of 32. Um, but... I don't care. Uh, so I will figure out a way to make the mohawk work anyhow. So will it be a full head mohawk again? Probably not. Uh, would I do like a mohawk that starts right here where my hair, ret <laughs> where my hair returns um, and kind of go down my head that way? Absolutely, because that's punk. Because punk cannot be defined. Punk is what you make of it. So whatever you're doing, go for it. Um, and uh, I've also thought about doing just the back as well. 
um, calling it a speed tail. I call it the speed tail, just doing a mohawk bit in the back. Because on the side, in the back, I have a full head of hair here still. So use what you got, right? Um, so I thought about that. Also, I figured, you know, speed tail, pretty good way to call that with uh, Le Mans just wrapping up today. Like the Porsche 917 or the, the new McLaren speed tail um, that they have. Um, also, uh, floating the idea of maybe doing what's called a reverse mohawk. Um, so if you don't know what a reverse mohawk is, Google it. Um, I would say Google uh, reverse mohawk Keith Flint. Keith Flint was the lead singer of The Prodigy. Um, he had a kick-ass reverse mohawk. And um, thinking about that very seriously, actually. Um, so, yeah, we'll see. We'll see where it goes. Um, but I won't be doing anything until January. So I do know that for sure. Uh, just because I'm going to grow it out. I've, I've never had long hair. So I know that this isn't long, really, for most people. But I've just this is long for me because it's never been this long before. So I don't know what's going on. So just going to let it go. So, but uh, yeah, that's some good stuff. Um, <laughs> that's where he launches rockets from. So it's actually very masculine. Thank you, Kai. I appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> uh, Smokey, Smokey says one day it'll just be a single spike coming out the back like your head has a lizard tail. Maybe. I don't know. So... Um, it'd be more like a dragon tail, right, Smokey? Dragon tail? Hell yeah. So, cool. Uh, but yeah, Leland, that's basically the, the lay, the lay of, the, of the land on top of my head at present. Um, so, yeah. Um, so, Johnny asking, are you still with the Tomorrow team? Uh, yes, I am. I am. Uh, we've just been very busy of late, unfortunately. Um, uh, for all of us who work on Tomorrow, Tomorrow is not our day job. Um, so tomorrow uh, does not pay the bills. It does pay, but it does not pay the bills. Um, so we do our day jobs, and the priority is our day jobs as opposed to tomorrow. Um, so for me, unfortunately, I have been absurdly busy with both of my jobs reopening now. Um, I'm not thrilled about the fact that both of my jobs have reopened. Um, and also, um, I, I feel like I just haven't been able, for me personally, in terms of like, why hasn't Space News been a consistent thing? I just feel like I haven't been able to get traction since the beginning of this year. Um, it, just in case you're unaware, in January and February, I had to deal with a double whammy. Um, I found out I had cancer, had to contend with that first. That was kind of a little bit of a thing that I had to knock out first. And um, I can happily say, eight months later, it's done. Uh, ain't nothing, ain't no, nothing stuck around. So. Very happy that we that we found that, took care of that immediately, got it done. It's it's dead. Um, I have to obviously watch for the rest of my life just in case. Um, but so far, the checkups I've had since then, nothing. Um, so I'm very very pleased that we caught it extremely early, handled it, and now it is um, not even like in remission. It's not an issue anymore. Um, and hopefully it will continue to not be an issue for the rest of my life. That would be very nice. Um, <laughs> I kind of would not like to have to deal with that C word again. Um, also, another C word I would like to not have to contend with that I did have to contend with uh, earlier this year uh, was COVID. Uh, so I caught COVID. It literally onset New Year's Eve for me. Um, so I literally started 2021 with plague. Um, and that knocked me out pretty good. Um, and... It, it, it took, I would say it probably took until about the end of March before I was finally 100% back to where I was or where I, I usually am. Um, so, um, and um, I still have issues even now with fatigue and other things like that. Um, I don't know if it's COVID related or not, uh, but yeah, it's, it's really, really, yeah, it's tough. Um, and also there's been some, mental health struggles and other things like that as well, um, as you can imagine, with pressures outside of tomorrow and other things that I've been contending with. Um, and it sucks uh, because um, it's very much showing a single point of failure, which is me. Um, so, uh, but working on it. Um, so uh, I just wanna say Ryan has been absolutely astounding with stepping up at tomorrow and making things happen. Um, so big shout outs to Ryan. Um, I know that there are I know that there are a handful of people who don't like Ryan um, and other things like that. And as far as I'm concerned, 
uh, they can kiss our ass because Ryan is amazing um, and Ryan is fantastic and does amazing work for us at tomorrow. So uh, Ryan, um, as much as those people would like him to go away, um, anytime that they say we don't want Ryan, it just tells us that we're doing the right thing um, and putting Ryan even further out in front uh, even more. So so uh, that's, that's my two cents on that. Um, uh, uh, oh, also Johnny Cheese asking, uh, glad to hear it. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm really glad to hear it too. It was, it was, it was I don't want to call it scary, but it was definitely like, like, what is going on? You know, like, like, why is this happening to me all of a sudden? It was literally one of those things where it was like a one-two punch, like cancer and COVID within a, a several weeks of each other. And I, I had to wait on my surgery before uh, I had to wait for COVID until I could have surgery. So God, that was just such a long period of time just going, man, I really hope it's not, I really hope this isn't spreading. So yeah, it was, it was, it was pretty scary. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that was, yeah, it's not, not, it's not even fun to think about, uh, with that there. Um, so, uh, Johnny Cheese also asking, uh, what about Griffith Observatory? Still working there? Yes, I am. Uh, still working there. Uh, we are, we are now open to the public officially. Um, I have a, a little bit of a weekend off, uh, this weekend. So I'm, I'm pleased about that. Uh, so very happy and, uh, yeah. That's pretty cool. So I still love, I, I love working up there. Um, I figure um, I'm never going away from Griffith's Observatory. They're going to have to like pry me away with a crowbar. Um, I'm probably going to die. Honestly, I'll probably pass away at the observatory. So that would be an appropriate place uh, for me to, to finally give up the ghost. So uh, assuming I'm not on another, like the moon or Mars uh, when that happens. Um, so yeah, so it's pretty cool. So, of natural causes, just to just to reiterate this, um, with it there. So, yeah, yeah, yes, we like Ryan Leland. Yeah, we really do. Uh, we do like Ryan. Ryan is very good. Ryan is very talented. I'm right now doing the next episode of News all by myself, and I don't know how in God's name Ryan does the SpaceX update because there is just so much stuff happening every single day. I cannot keep up with it. It is so difficult. I'm literally going to have to skip so much. Um, just to make this episode work. Um, also, it doesn't help that it's been a month <laughs> since our last episode. But I mean, you know, we have day jobs, so those those are those take the priority. So it's kind of it's kind of how it goes um, with it there. But I mean, hey, it's it, uh, tomorrow's not over. Um, in case anybody was wondering, we've just been on a really long, <laughs> protracted, weird hiatus thing going on. So. Um, so yeah, uh, by the way, uh, tomorrow we'll be returning is, is planned to return live no earlier than October 8th. Just want to let you know. So live shows, uh, are going to move to Friday nights, Pacific time. So, um, so prepare yourselves however you need to. Um, so that's good. Um, moving to that time because just don't want to interfere uh, with other folks. I know NASA space flight really, uh, NASA space flight kind of has the Saturday, uh, slot filled up now and uh, that's fantastic kind of don't want to don't want to step over them um that's why i've moved my live streams my ask me almost anything uh, to sundays uh, and our hangouts that we have because they i just don't there's i when people are good you don't want to get in their way and damn nasa space flight is really good and they deserve all the success that they've got um that they've that they've built up over the past two years so please you know take that slot do it you know um they've they've it's been a it's been an absolute joy watching them take off like they have they they've um chris has been working at, at nasa space like for so long and it's so great to see that recognition finally happening happening and um uh, both chris's um with it there it's just so cool uh to see them like taking off like the rockets they cover so um that's really cool uh Excuse me, that was, I'm still eating breakfast over here and I, I received some extra. Uh, okay, so we've got, so we got, wow, we got some observatory questions, y'all are interested in it. Uh, so Johnny Cheese asking, is, the, uh, is Griffith the same observatory from Rebel Without a Cause? Yes, it is. It actually, um, yes, Rebel Without a Cause uh, used Griffith Observatory as the observatory 
uh, throughout the movie, and it is in a lot of scenes in Rebel Without a Cause. Um, we actually do have a monument to James Dean up there, if you want to take a look at it. Somebody's, up oh, the fly's back. Um, somebody made like a like an artistic statue of James Dean's face, and, and to me, it's rather horrifying to look at. Um, but art's art, so one man's art is another person's nightmare, I suppose. So, but it, I don't know, if I had somebody make a statue of my, a monument of my face that looked like that, it's not like Ronaldo bad, Ronaldo statue bad, but it's definitely like, huh, huh, hmm. Yeah, that's like a face-melting nightmare scenario kind of thing. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, uh, Kai, you're asking, is it two big uh, do uh, bronze gold domes or three domes? It's, we have three um, at the observatory. They're actually made of copper, in case you wanted to know. Um, and uh, they are oxidized, so, um, so unfortunately they're not shiny anymore. Um, not, that they, not that they really were shiny to begin with, but they're, they're not as shiny as they were. They're, they're duller, I guess. I still think they're beautiful. Um, but ever looking at Griffith Observatory from the front door, big dome in the center, that's our planetarium. Uh, the dome on your left, dome to the east, that's our Zeiss telescope, 12 inch Zeiss refracting telescope, which we bought uh, from the Carl Zeiss company in Vienna, Germany in 1932 that was actually the first thing that was purchased for the observatory it's bought from a catalog if you can believe it for i think somewhere on the order of about twelve thousand dollars which was quite a lot for 1932. it came over they installed it got it ready to go then uh, we opened up on may 14th 1935. Uh, first night line went across the roof down the stairs out into the front lawn and it was cloudy so, <laughs> so it actually wasn't until May 15th that the first light uh, uh, through our Zeiss telescope occurred um, there. Um, yeah, so you're looking at those domes. You got the Zeiss over on the left, the east side, and then over on the west side, we have another dome there um, on the right side, if you're looking from the front door. Uh, that's our Celestat. That is a uh, three-mirrored solar telescope. Um, we send the light to three different areas in the level below. Uh, and uh, the public is not allowed to go inside of that dome um, simply because the safety standards in there are um, as best that we can make them for us who work there. Um, so we really don't want the public going in there and potentially hurting themselves um, because the safety standards are up to spec um, mostly for the 1930s. We have additional things in there that allow us to still operate it um, in 2021, um, but as you can imagine, um, yeah, it's it's not a room for just random folks to jump into. Um, it's not like our Zeiss where, you know, it's a flat floor with stairs that you go up and then you look through the telescope. Which, by the way, you do look through the telescope itself. There's an eyepiece at the bottom of it. You look through it. So just like you would have back in 1935, we have not changed anything. Uh, it's still manually moved. Um, it is ran by a, a quarter horsepower motor from a sewing machine. Um, and it does weigh 18,000 pounds, but it's so perfectly balanced um, that I've been able to move our Zeiss telescope with my pink, just pushing it gently with my pinky finger, um, been able to move it like that. So it's, a, it's an amazing instrument. I absolutely love it. Uh, it's also the most looked through telescope in the world. We're probably now at about 8 million people have looked through the telescope. Uh, so, yeah, it's a lot. So, uh, also Johnny Cheese asking, is there any research conducted at Griffith? And if so, are you involved in any way? Uh, no, uh, Griffith Observatory is not a research observatory. Uh, the whole point of Griffith Observatory is that we are a public observatory. We are there to allow you to look through a telescope and also find out about the latest news uh, from science, scientists, astronomers, cosmologists, and other things. Uh, we do not do research. In the 60s, there was a bit of research done. Um, uh, I believe it was astrometry, where you're basically measuring uh, very precise, very precise, uh, you're taking very precise measurements of things like uh, brightness and other stuff um, with, uh, with stars. Um, but that was done after hours. They were not allowed to do that uh, during any time that the, that the public was scheduled to look through the telescope. So, um, yeah. So we've always been about the public. Um, I work with the public. 
I help talk about science with the public, um, also help out our curatorial staff in helping them figure out how to talk about aerospace and other things because um, there is a lot of astronomers on staff, but there are no aerospace engineers, except for me, uh, and, uh, and a few other people. And we kind of help interpret those stories and uh, tell them how to do it. Um, so Johnny, so Johnny Cheese, uh, do you have a Coronado for solar observations? So for those of you who don't know, uh, Coronado telescopes are, uh, Coronado is a type, uh, brand of solar telescope. I think they're made by, I think they're like a division of Celestron, if I remember correctly. Um, so myself personally, I don't have a solar telescope. Um, the sun really isn't something I like, show, like to look at. Um, or well, uh, first of all, you should never look at the sun through a regular telescope, so don't do that. Uh, just to kind of throw that in there, make sure I got that covered. Um, and uh, the uh, a Coronado has filters that allows you to safely do it. Um, but I don't really like to look at the sun because I'm outside and it can, it can kind of be hot here in Los Angeles. And it's, that's a tough day doing that. Um, but in our, in our C-list at our solar telescope at the observatory, we actually do have a small Coronado in it. Um, but we use that. It's not a part of the tr of the three beams of light. Um, one of those one of the beams of light we have has an extra mirror in it that reflects out to a Coronado, uh, and that Coronado is used for what we call our equivalency station. Um, so the observatory was built in 1935. Unfortunately, in 1935, um, things like 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 accommodating people with disabilities was not considered. And so um, because of the historic nature of our building too, we are really not actually, I mean, technically, legally, we're not allowed to change things about our building. Um, so we developed a really cool system with what we call equivalency stations. Um, so we actually have a spot in the same area where the three beams of light are coming that allow you to take a look at the sun, um, we have a spot where you can actually uh, go to if you have a if you have a a disability that will prevent you from going upstairs. Um, we actually have a spot that you can go to that will pipe in this image from the Coronado to allow you to take a look at the sun. Um, so you could see it just like you would if you were looking through our actual instrument that we have available um, for you at the public. Um, so. Yeah, so it's pretty cool. Uh, we also have the exact same thing for our Zeiss telescope, too. It's just on the other side uh, of that main level of the observatory. Um, because, oops, sorry, I got to get rid of a fly in here. There we go. Um, so the, uh, our, our Zeiss telescope dome is decidedly not at all uh, able to accommodate anybody with a disability. Um, like, at all. There is multiple, multiple stairways you know, in and out. Um, so we have, a, we have a station downstairs. Um, welcome back, Colton. We have a station downstairs that actually has like an eyepiece um, that allows you to take a look uh, through it like you would uh, our actual telescope. And I think that's so cool uh, that we have that there. So, so if you're unable physically uh, to make it up to the telescope, don't worry, we got you covered. So. Um, and also there's a little, uh, our, our operator in the telescope has a microphone on as well. So you can, you can hear them talk, hear them talking, um, about whatever they're looking at at that time. So it's very much, you, you get the same experience as you would up there. And I think that's so cool that they, uh, added that on and kept that. Um, there is a fun thing, um, that I have, that I really want to mention. If I ever make a video about Griffith, visiting Griffith or anything like that, I got to show it. Um, which is that our front doors, we have a door that says entrance, and then the door next to it says not an entrance. <laughs> and that's because under, under ADA, we basically have to say that this is not actually an entrance, even though it is an entrance, because it, there are stairs that lead to our front doors. You, there is no real, there is no way for, say, someone in a wheelchair to go in through the front doors. We have ramps on the side, so you can come in either side of our side doors. Um, but the front door, no, nah, you can't come through it um, because it's stairs. Um, 
uh, and um, yeah, it's uh, it's really funny because we can't change anything on the building because it's a historic building, but we also have to comply with ADA standards. Uh, so we have a set of doors where one where the door on the left says entrance and the one on the right says not an entrance. Um, and if you Google Griffith Observatory entrance, not an entrance, there are lots of photos of, <laughs> of that. Um, and I quite, I, I think it's pretty funny um, with that there. Um, oh, this is a good one, uh, Smokey. Uh, so Smokey's saying, does the guy with the horn still come every day and ask when sunset is? Um, so uh, the guy with the horn, um, so this was a, a fellow uh, who uh, during a solar eclipse, or not a solar eclipse, excuse me, a lunar eclipse a couple years ago, um, actually showed up, um, oh gosh, what's the name of it? It's that Egyptian headdress. Uh, can't think of what it's called. Same one that uh, King Tut's sarcophagus has on. Somebody will Google it and uh, um, and bring it and bring and say what its name is and bring it to my attention um, with that there. Uh, he showed up wearing one of these and some robes and stuff. And when the moon reached uh, maximum eclipse, he had like a like a horn that was actually <laughs> a horn that was actually. Um, like like a I don't know was it like a ram's horn or something but you could you could like blow in it and it, you know something like that and he blew it you know as soon as we reached maximum eclipse and then as the moon was setting at the eclipse he blew it again um, and it was just like perfect it was just some some random person um, who just showed up who just happened to have all this um, so um, haven't seen him since unfortunately. Uh, so don't don't know what happened, um, but I hope I hope he's doing well, and I hope he's blowing his horn everywhere he can, um, because that was like surprising, but also like awesome. So so, yep, yep, Colton, I think you found it. Yep, there's tons of photos of it. Entrance, not an entrance. <laughs> Which I wanna say, um, if you notice, I just wanna point this out, our dedication to authenticity at um, at Griffith Observatory is second to none. Because you'll notice in the entrance, not an entrance sign, the entrance sign is from the 1930s. The not an entrance sign is from the 20 aughts, okay? So 70 years apart, they still got the exact same font at the exact same size for the not an entrance sign, as they did for the entrance sign they made in the 1930s. So in case you ever think that we're not dedicated up at the observatory to preserving our mission that we were first doing in 1935, let me tell you. Yeah, we're dedicated. <laughs> I still love that we run our Zeiss telescope um, just as they did in the in 1935. Like, like we use um, sorry, we use uh, um, sidereal time, so we use that for the time at zenith in the sky, um, and a almanac, and that's how our telescope operator determines what they're going to look at for the night and how to do so. Um, and it's amazing because they use uh, the sidereal time overhead. The almanac, uh, some arithmetic with cranium mark one, and I've never seen in my almost a decade of working at Griffith Observatory, I've never seen a telescope operator miss an object up there on our size. 
So um, the, the computer controlled telescopes that we have out on the front lawn that folks can look through, um, yeah, those can sometimes be problematic. Um, but the Zeiss itself, nah, it's pretty, pretty I've, I've never seen anybody miss, ever. So, so that's impressive. So I think it also says a lot too about our, our telescope staff that they can still operate um, this amazing instrument from, from the 1930s uh, perfectly. And uh, yeah, it's a great telescope. Um, not the biggest telescope in the world. Uh, there are bigger telescopes that you could look through. Uh, I have. Um, uh, up at Mount Wilson, which is actually here in the Los Angeles area, we have a 60 inch and a 100 inch telescope. Um, and both of them actually, when they were operating originally, were the largest telescopes in the world. Uh, the 60 inch telescope was the largest when it opened in the early 19 aughts, I wanna say. I don't know the exact day it opened, or exact year it opened. Um, but then the 100 inch, the Hooker telescope, up there, the 100 inch Hooker telescope opened in 1917, and that was the largest one in the world. Um, until uh, Palomar in 1948, when its 200-inch Hale telescope um, opened. So, yeah, and you can actually go rent them out, um, and, and you can rent them out for half a night or a full night, and you can and you get a couple operators, and they run the gamut of what's in the sky. So, uh, and I've done a night on the 60-inch up there um, with coworkers from Griffith because it's really cool. Is that it's expensive. Uh, but get 30 of your friends together, and it's 30 bucks for the night on the 60 inch. So, which is like, what the hell? Like six, six, 60 inches of telescope for 30 bucks for the night with professionals running it for you to take a look at things? Good lord. Um, and then also you get to like bring food up and other stuff like that. It just becomes like a great party. So, uh, one of my coworkers brought his theremin up to it and did like a little concert for like an hour on his theremin, and it was great. The theremin in a telescope dome while we're looking at things in space. Like, how, how much better does it get than that? So, that was a really cool night. So, um, and what's really cool too is that sometimes you had to, like, I don't want to say like climb onto the telescope, but you had to, like, physically hold yourself on the telescope. Oh, Ocean says it's uh, $60 these days. Yeah, I would imagine. Uh, gosh, how long ago was that? Oh, my goodness. It was like seven years ago. I need to get back up there. So, I, I, would, I would imagine they probably raised their prices a bit, but at the same time, $60 for a full night on a telescope with five feet of mirror. Whew. Man, you, you don't really get, you, you can't get that anywhere else in the world. So um, I don't know if the Hooker Telescope is the largest telescope that you can just buy time on. Um, I want to say it is. Um, but that's obviously a bit more than $60 per person per night. So, um, so that one's a little bit out of reach. Um, but I have been in there and I have sat at the desk that Edwin Hubble used to determine that we were in a universe. So that was pretty cool, I gotta say. So, and I sat in the chair that Einstein did. So that was pretty cool too. So uh, they actually still have uh, Hubble's locker uh, still still up there at Mount Wilson. So, uh, yeah, I still have his locker labeled and everything. So it was pretty cool. So I put, I put my uh, dinner for the night next to Hubble, Hubble's locker. So it was pretty cool. Yeah. All right, we're going into hour two now of my, uh, today's Ask Me Anything. You all are certainly welcome to ask. If I can't answer it, I'll just say, I can't answer that. But I really can't think of too many things that I really can't answer. So you all are certainly welcome to poke and prod as willingly and deeply as you dare. While I continue to eat my breakfast for the second hour. <laughs> it's a overcast day here in LA. I'll take it. So. <clears throat> okay. 
Colton says, I instantly imagined myself dancing and rubbing butts with Einstein. That's a, that's a thought. I could, I could see Einstein doing that, too. He'd be, like, dancing, playing his violin, you know, like, getting down. Can you imagine Einstein with a violin, like, twerking? I can. So, he seems like the kind of guy who would do that. Just having a good time. Uh, Smokey, boxers or briefs? Briefs. So, I'm not... I mean, I, I guess boxers are nice, but, like, you know... You could hurt yourself. So, I wear briefs. And then, you know, gold bond powder. Keep yourself super fresh. That's what I do. So, that's how I handle that. <laughs> I don't know if you guys know who Anthony Mackie is. He plays uh, Falcon. In the, in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. There's a really great video of him that he did with GQ that talks about his day, like his daily routines and stuff. <laughs> At one point, <laughs> one point he talks about like his grooming techniques. And he's like, yeah, then you take, you know, like you take your gold bond and you powder your man. And I was just like, I know, I know what he's talking about. <laughs> As a brief swear, I know what he's talking about. So, that's a euphemism. So, yeah, it's a good stuff. Yeah, again, he doesn't ask me anything. I'll say whatever I want. So, you all brought this on yourselves. So don't get mad at me. I'm just answering the questions that you throw my way. Talk about powder your man. <laughs> oh boy. Yeah, powder your man. <laughs> so it's today's the, if you take anything away from today's ask me anything stream, powder your man. Oh my god, Colton. 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 Oh my god. Yep. Yeah, pour some gold bond on me. To stop the sweat. Pour some gold. Yep. Yep. That's some good stuff. Good lord, Colton. I love you. Um okay. Um Smokey. What, in your opinion, should never get put on a pizza? Let's get some people mad. What should never go on a pizza? Actually, I don't care. As long as it's good, put it on a pizza. I know there's some people that are like, pineapple doesn't belong on pizza, but I, I strictly don't care. I'm a, an ingredients, I'm an ingredient anarchist, very much. Just like in the sandwich alignment, I'm an ingredient and structural anarchist. Everything's a sandwich. So, eggs, the eggs I'm eating are a sandwich. So, so is the toast. Is bacon? Sandwich. Sandwich. You ready for this one? Smoky. Should you be fine with someone putting gummy bears on a pizza? Sure. Go for it. Make my day. I'm cool with that. As long as it tastes good. That's all I care about. When I'm eating pizza, as long as it tastes good. I don't even care where it comes from. Because usually if I'm having pizza, there's usually a large quantity of alcohol that's also being consumed concurrently. So, so I don't want to necessarily say I don't care about the quality of my pizza, but there are times where I'm just like, you know what? I'm just going to go to Little Caesars. I'm going to buy three hot and ready's, and I'm going to sit, have an edible or six, 
uh, and go to town. So, tonight is a night which will live in dairy infamy. So, so that's how that's how I feel about it. Oh, Colton, <clears throat> Colton's gonna order a pizza with Harry. <coughs> oh my gosh! Excuse me. It's a bacon. Pardon me. Now, that's something that I will always, I will never. <clears throat> so here's something that I will always insist on, which is that bacon has to be crispy. Um, you, just floppy bacon stuff? No. Crispy. Um, okay. Uh, Nathan. What's up, Nathan? Good to see you. Welcome aboard. How are you liking... Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Can I read today? How are you liking how your hair is progressing? How long till you can mohawk it? Um, so I'm, I'm, I think it's pretty cool. I've never, uh, so I'll just kind of go through this because this is like my third or fourth time talking about it in this AMAA. But I mean, hey, it's cool. I'm good with it. Um, so uh, I'm just going to grow my hair out till the end of the year. Uh, I've never had my hair this long before. I've always had it cut short, even when I was a kid. Uh, so every second, my hair, is get, my hair is the longest it's ever been because your hair constantly grows. So every second, it, it, I mean, every piece of time we move forward, it's the longest it's ever been. Um, so I'm just going to go to the end of the year. So it looks like I actually could just stop. Right, I, I could just go shave it right now to Mohawk right now, but uh, not going to. Also, uh, as I've been showing off to everybody here, uh, because my, uh, my own self-image um, and my own self-worth uh, and my, uh, um, what do you call it, uh, my feelings on myself, um, are not particularly defined by my physical attributes. I'm much more, um, much more invested in the things I do. Um, so as you can see, uh, I have become uh, one with male pattern baldness uh, at the ripe age of 32. Uh, so we'll have to see how the, uh, how the Mohawk does uh, upon its return. Uh, so some ideas. Uh, as you saw, right about here, I still have a full head of hair all the way in the back, so I may start it right here, right in the middle, go back with it. Uh, Mohawks are punk. Punk is what you make of it, so that's the way I look at it. Um, I may do it just in the back, because I s still have a full head of hair in my back right here, uh, and uh, kind of Mohawk it backwards, uh, and I call that the speed tail after the uh, Porsche 917 uh, at Le Mans, which, you know, Le Mans just wrapped up this morning. Uh, and also the new McLaren Speed Tail, which I think is a beautiful car. Um, or I may actually go the full uh, Keith Flint from The Prodigy and do a reverse mohawk. So basically shaved here uh, with hair on the sides. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Uh, but it won't be until January. Mostly out of curiosity uh, with that. So, so yeah. That's my hairs. That's the hairs. Uh, oh, it's a good one. Johnny Cheese asking, do you engage in religious debates with members of your family? Well, Johnny Cheese, it just so happens uh, that, uh, no, I don't. I uh, never really have, uh, mostly because my family is, uh, how do I describe it? Not particularly religious. So, uh, my, so my mom uh, does respect some aspects of religion um, but we are, uh, unlike many Americans, uh, we just don't care. <laughs> uh, we're, uh, my mom, is, uh, does not believe that her beliefs should be laws of the land. Um, she just kind of, I don't want to say she keeps them to herself, but, um, yeah, we just, we just, uh, she just feels that. I mean, I can't. I can't really speak for her, but she doesn't. She doesn't really make demands or anything like that. She's just, you know, people are people. So, um, and that, I think that's really cool because um, I grew up. <clears throat> I grew up uh, Christian, obviously, uh, here in in the United States because uh, we are a heavily Christian nation, um, and. Uh, I, I, if I, had, if I had to, like, narrow down the denomination, it'd be Baptist, uh, Southern Baptist, too. So, we call that a shouting church. Um, so, you know, people, you know, people, like, 
you know, dancing and, and doing the whole, you know, like, like something's overcoming them. And they're like speaking in tongues, you know, should about a Honda, should about a Honda, should about a Toyota, should about a Nissan, you know, something like that. Um, and uh, yeah, it was, it was an interesting, <laughs> it's interesting. Um, I never really like bought into it. So, well, I don't want to say I never bought into it. That's, that's, I guess that's mean to people who, who this is a big thing to them. Um, but yeah, yeah, I just had a really, really interesting religious experiences throughout my, my young childhood um, that basically have informed me that it's a hakakui and um, yeah, I'm not religious at all. So um, I don't, I don't, I'd say math is my religion, mathematics, because it makes sense. Math. There's like, it, it, math guides the physics of the universe and that just makes sense. So if I were to have to assign a, high pow a higher power to anything, um, I would math. Um, and I always say though, you know, that just because I don't like believe in a higher power that can like physically manifest itself or anything like that outside of physics, um, doesn't mean that I can't have like very similar experiences. Um, you know, when I'm <clears throat> doing some of the backpacking I've done, uh, especially in the high Sierras, the Sierra, Sierra uh, Nevada mountains uh, here in California. Um, there's just times where you turn a corner and you just see things that just like, I can't help but look at it and just be like, wow, like, thank you nature for this opportunity to see this. Like, this is amazing. So, yeah. So, you know, I could, I can get that feeling as well. I suppose I just don't get it. I just don't need to go to, uh, a, a building full of people. Um, <laughs> good one, Ryan. I don't need to go to a building full of people um, and uh, a tax-free building full of people <laughs> and, uh, and get that uh, from, from an invisible power. Um, I, can, I can definitely go out and get that, the exact same feeling from something tangible um, that I can experience. So, yeah. So... Yeah, it's a complicated, it's a pretty complicated question, so, especially here in the United States, because, oh, God, let me tell you, so, yeah, it sure, it sure feels like people are, certain groups of people are pining for a, an authoritarian theocracy to be installed, you know? But that's none of my business. Yeah, being queer too, with the queer experience. Yeah, I don't mesh with religion well, <laughs> just from that outright. So, yeah. So, rights for me, but none for thee. Yeah. All right. Wow. This took a very interesting turn. <laughs> but ask me anything. So. That's the way it goes. So what's up? What are we doing now? Yeah, Smokey haven't messed with religion for a long while. Yeah, it's just, you know, I, I the only word I can think of to describe it, at least for how it is here in the United States, is it's very commercialized. Um, when you can have 40,000 people in the same spot and you're your spiritual leader is is flying in their Gulfstream G5, you know, to places. I, you know, I just, it doesn't just sit, it just doesn't sit well with me, you know? Like, I don't, you know, I don't know if Jesus would have had a Gulfstream, but I kind of think he wouldn't have. I'm confident he probably would have used public transit or a skateboard. I could see Jesus on a skateboard. So, but not like cool youth pastor skateboard like actually skateboarding so yeah yeah so that's that's my take but I do want to say this so just, I do want to say this um, if you are religious that's cool there's absolutely nothing wrong with being religious at all um, 
you, there should be no inhibition of your ability to practice your religion. As long as it's not harming anybody. So that means that if you're going to be restricting people's rights and freedoms based upon your religion, no, -uh. no, no. That's that's HS. So, no. Um, and as you can imagine, here in the United States, there's a large quantity of people that believe that that laws and other things should be set by what's in their their book of choice. And I say book of choice because I don't really want to say Bible because there are so many different versions of it that it's almost dependent upon what version is being read as to what laws this specific group wants to throw. So, it's just it's dumb. <laughs> That's a good one, Ryan. Yeah, Colton, I went to a Catholic school up to sixth grade. Oh, sorry. Oh boy, is that weird when I think about it? I, I suppose. Catholicism is pretty, it's interesting. So I'll say something, actually. A friend of mine um, shared something on Facebook today that was like, like atheists who were into biblical history chatting with other people, you know? And I felt that, like, I find it very interesting, but it's also very funny with that. Um, yeah, I agree, Smokey. Jesus wouldn't need a Gulf Stream because he would have advocated for high-speed rail. I agree. Uh, Ryan, I know Jesus didn't need a boat because he could just walk on the water. <laughs> damn, damn, he sure could. Um, another solid one, Ryan. If I made a religion, it'd be a PDF for sure. Books cost too much. It's true. Uh, Phil, the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster is the one true religion. Everyone else is going to al dente hell. Ramen. So, very nice. Very nicely done there. I see what you did there. It's good stuff. So, all right, yeah. So that's religion. <laughs> there's, there's our, there's our, our one that we have today uh, for that. So. Oh, uh, oh, this is a good one. Um, Marston. Yeah, this is a really good question. Um, which this is not ignorance, by the way, Morrison, so you're fine. So, Jared, please forgive me for my ignorance, which is not ignorance. Um, but what is the difference between being queer and gay slash lesbian? Um, it's just kind of how you identify yourself. Um, there's, there's, really no, there's really no right or wrong. Queer, to me, is a umbrella term. Um, everyone who I would describe as non-heteronormative, or basically um, not a man and a woman, um, uh, anybody in a relationship that is not man-woman um, could be under the umbrella of queer. I guess that's how I would describe it. Um, of course, there's probably somebody online who would get very mad at me uh, for even suggesting that such a thing uh, could possibly occur. Um, but I usually use queer um, just because it's a catch-all um, for, for a lot of us. Um, and also, I don't fit into... Um, I don't really fit into a lot of the slots myself personally um, because I, I myself describe myself as pansexual so that would mean that I don't look at the physical attributes of a person is to determine my attraction to them or not. Um, so that's a pretty big uh, portion of it. Also, I'm poly so that means um, that I, I am uh, okay with multiple partners in a relationship um, even if it is a partner who's in a relationship with one of my partners, but not in a relationship with me. Um, I very much believe the idea of um, two people marrying and then attaching themselves to each other for the rest of their lives is a great setup for failure. Um, it, it, it's, it's, to me, it just is, I just don't buy into it because there are multiple people throughout my life that I have loved nearly and dearly in my heart, and uh, I just don't buy it. I just don't buy the idea that there are that you could that you could only love one other person on on such a deep, intimate level for the rest of your life, and that's it. Nobody else. Nobody else. Um, I just don't buy that. 
So I think it's silly. I don't want. I, I don't want to describe it as limiting, as in ooh, I can't. Um, I can't sleep around or anything like that. No, that's that's not at all what it's about. It's about the fact that I I understand that there are um, there are people that are very near and dear to me that are much closer to me than a friend would be, um, and that we both have love for each other that could not be described as like friendship. It is something above and beyond uh, that. So that's how I would kind of identify uh, or d try to describe it uh, with that there. So I just, I just think, you know, you are, you are now partners for life um, is a very silly thing to do simply because, simply because if you have a love should not be restricted I guess is how I should put it. Um, that, however, does not mean uh, that you get to violate things like age of consent um, or consent or things like that. Um, so um, I still 100% fully believe in all of that. Um, so, um, so of age and of ability to consent, 100%. Uh, but outside of that, I feel that uh, uh, marrying yourself to a single entity um, if you will, uh, to kind of describe it that way, uh, is uh, wrong. I don't feel that, um, shoe fly, I don't feel that uh, my friends who do it are wrong. That's, it, is, it is their prerogative to do that. Uh, but I feel that in my own personal way that I feel and the, my own personal way that I experience uh, love and like to show my love to folks that I do deeply, um, yeah. It's, uh, it's restrictive, uh, and it uh, doesn't make me feel particularly great. So, so that's just my opinion. Um, I know that's definitely, um, um, so uh, being out and queer is, is not as difficult as it was, I would say, even 10 years ago. Um, it is still a very difficult thing, um, because holy moly, let me tell you, if you, um, I've walked into rooms full of engineers before, and everyone will immediately look at the pride band on my watch. And some people will give me a look that makes it as if they're approving what they're seeing. Uh, but in my general experience, uh, especially in aerospace, uh, if somebody's looking at my pride band, it's usually with uh, not with uh, recognition in a positive light um, but I am out and I don't care so and if you have a problem with me because of my orientation or the means by which I decide to express myself to other folks that problem is yours it's not mine so so that's my opinion on that one right there um, and then uh, obviously being poly is something that I don't want to I don't want to call it taboo, but it's definitely usually not something that people are going to admit to publicly. But also, at the same time, I'm not going to be BSing people um, about who I am as a person um, because I, I just not, I don't need to do that. You know, I'm not here to hide who I am or try to identify or try to put aspects of my life in the, sh in the shadows. Um, yeah, it's just who I am. And I don't have a problem with myself. And if other people have a problem with myself, that's theirs. That's their problem to have, not mine. So yeah. And I, I am very much uh, in, in agreement in applying that to everyone else as well. So it would be immensely hypocritical of me if I were to be like, no, you know, oh, you, you know, oh gosh, I can't believe that, like, oh, there's this, this, fling you're having and all this other stuff like it would be very silly for me to to be on a level of hypocrisy like that and uh no i don't i don't subscribe to that either so um there is like a real issue in the queer community of things like like ew girls and other things like that. ew guys you know um it's it's really interesting how like a marginalized group will make groups within itself marginalized as well um and it always just blows my mind that that's that that happens to begin with but it does um and i just i don't buy into that at all so yeah 
So yeah, that's my experience. So um, yeah. And one of the things that actually uh, made me come to terms uh, with, with being out about who I was, um, was I actually lost a job uh, because I was queer. So I got forced out of a position that I was really enjoying because of that. Um, and I decided at that moment that like from here on out, I'm going to be 100% honest about who I am because if somebody can force me out of a job and I'm not even out yet, then I don't want to be working for somebody who is going to have a problem with this later on down the line. So I'm out, out of the closet, here I come. So what's up world, here's me. So if you don't like this, you know, piss, you know, piss off for all I care. So yeah, so in case anybody's wondering, you know, have I ever experienced, you know, things like discrimination or not? Yeah, I lost the job, so. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's pretty interesting. Like I'll hold my partner, you know, if I wanna like do like a public display of affection with my partner, like like hold their hand or, or put my arm around them in public, you have no idea how fast the eyes, come, how the knives come out in people's eyes. It's, it's stunning, you know? You know, just people who you would walk by regularly giving you the worst possible looks ever. Like, your existence deeply offends them. And that's fine with me. Get mad. <laughs> so, yeah. <sighs> oh my God, Smokey, gee. You are so cool with multiple partners and you live in LA. So does that make you Polly Shore? I'll see myself out. Yes, please see yourself out. So, yeah. Warston, you live in Belgium and it's very accepted and common. That is excellent. Yeah, I tend to find uh, that, that uh, people who are not from the United States tend to not care. Um, it's, it seems to be a very American thing to dislike other people. <laughs> so part of our proud history here in the United States. So in the freest of all the lands that we don't discriminate against other people unless we're allowed to, then we can't. So, um, yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> As you can imagine, my politics kind of don't align with, with most of what you find in the United States. So um, it, my, my stuff would, even for Europe, would be considered very left, left-wing politics uh, with it there. So, so here in the United States, I'm... Oh, I'm b almost an a a a borderline anarchist at this point. So anarcho-communist, I guess is how I would describe it. So, yeah. Which is funny because I work in an industry that's apparently being revolutionized by, by certain other economic uh, things. And I can't sit here and say that it's not. It's because it is. So, um, so, yeah. It's interesting. Just the duality. The duality of Jared. So, <laughs> um, yeah. So that's what I got so far. So yeah, cool, interesting discussion. Um, so thanks, Warston, for uh, kicking that one off. That was a that was a really it was a real treat. I'm glad glad I got to. I'm learning y'all today. So we started out with Yorkshire pudding. Now we're talking about the queer experience and some other things. And yeah, we're just we're just going to boxers your brief, powder your man. You know some other things. <laughs> so. Oh yeah, Warston, you're an American living um, in, uh, in there in the difference of culture. Yeah, it's very interesting. Um, yeah, it's I've, you know I've got coworkers that were not from the United States, from Europe, and it's really interesting how they approach things uh, with a significantly larger degree of openness than, than folks here in the United States do. Uh, yeah, Yorkshire pudding, uh, Phil, you missed it. We talked about Yorkshire pudding um, for a few minutes, and then. Uh, we talked about, uh, what was it, uh, British Standard 6008, which is the official standard on how to make British tea correctly. Um, so look it up. Look it up. So uh, Johnny Cheese, I've read that uh, the Afghan LGBT community is in great danger right now. Yeah, absolutely. It is, um, man, that is just such a horrendous situation right now. It's just, that's been amazingly, it has been unbelievably depressing um, watching that and not really being able to do much um, with that. So yeah, that's been tough this week. Um, kind of, I don't want to necessarily say reaffirming my position to not really watch the news, but it is, it's difficult for me to watch the news period just because it is 
the, the news is not made uh, uh, for you to enjoy it. Um, it is, it's the ad revenue is most certainly designed, uh, much like Twitter and some other social media is, from, from making you feel awful because you get greater engagement out of that. So, uh, yeah, which is terrible. So, um, but also if something bad is happening, the whole world needs to see it. So, and it, it's just terrible. So, yeah. All right. We're now two and a half hours in. So, <clears throat> kind of continuing on. If we're moving elsewhere, any point. So, if you're just joining, <clears throat> My name's Jared. You've probably seen me before on the YouTube series tomorrow, TMRO, about space flight and other things. This is a Ask Me Almost Anything. And why is it an Ask Me Almost Anything? Well, there are some things I can't talk about because I've got NDAs and other stuff uh, with that. Because when you work in aerospace, you get to see some cool things, and that often means that you can't talk about them. Uh, so, uh, you can ask me almost anything. But as you can see, some of them... Um, uh, some of them are wide open, so you can see we, we just talked about uh, the queer experience and, and being polyamorous, which I am in all of those. Uh, and we also talked about boxers or briefs. So uh, that's how that goes. So, um, yeah. Yeah, and Colton, to kind of speak to that, uh, which is, you know, I don't think I can marry more than one person here in Texas, though. Nothing says that you have to marry somebody. So uh, marriage is just a... Marriage is a construct. Um, so it's, marriage is a, a, I don't want to call it like a legally binding <laughs> document, but, um, but very much, uh, yeah, I mean, marriage to me makes uh, very little sense unless um, you're doing things for very specific purposes like health insurance and other things like that. So, um, which that I totally understand, which, um, which I will most certainly probably be doing something uh, very similar to that uh, once I get uh, full full stuff where I can throw my partner on there. So, uh, but also my partner right now works at a job where they get full benefits. So just like I do. So, yeah. <clears throat> uh, so Nathan asking, have you played Kerbal Space Program? And what was your most interesting hardest mission? If you do, uh, yes. I do play uh, Kerbal Space Program. I haven't played it in a hot minute, though. It's been a little bit of time. Um, the hardest thing I ever did, um, I'd say the hardest mission I ever did, uh, was I basically just did a mission that was just like a, uh, like, uh, like Project Sundiver. I just, like, put on the brakes as much as I could and just had something dive into the sun um, in the system. And that was, damn, that was hard. Because that was a lot of rockets to pull that off. A lot of delta V energy to expend um, to do that, which in real life, that's how that works. Um, so, yeah. So, so, yeah, it was really difficult, but I greatly enjoyed the challenge of it, and, uh, yeah, eventually overheated, and kaboom, so with that, so. <laughs> Very cheeky, Ryan. Health insurance, imagine not having a national health service. Come on. You just had a major car accident and you're brain dead. Just pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You can pay for it. <clears throat> I had a friend who just had an over, literally an overnight stay in a hospital for something. I can't remember what it was. And it ended up not being like a major medical emergency. But just an overnight stay in a room with medications and blood work in a test. Their insurance covered it. But if they didn't have insurance, it would have been $45,000. 45000 dollars $45, One night in a hospital. The blood test alone in the laboratory was... $30,000. Somebody's getting ripped off. So it's much like Independence Day, you know, that line. 
You know, what, you think they pay $10,000 for a hammer, $20,000 for a toilet seat? Well, in the American medical system, you sure do. So I'm very lucky to have a job where I have health insurance. Because um, as someone who is bipolar and, and very severely bipolar um, at times, um, or, or can be, um, and... Uh, yeah, I would, I would, I would not be here without health insurance. So I would be dead. Um, that's one of the things. I was very lucky to be on Obamacare uh, when I had my onset of, of bipolar disorder. So, so, oh my God, Ocean, I'm so sorry about that. Ugh. Ugh. So frustrating. I swear, it's like making money off of people dying. It's the the most despicable possible thing. And they just gleefully do it here in this country. So it's absolutely annoying. Yeah. Uh, yep, there you go. Oriston, I had a buddy break his arm and it cost him 26 euro to get it set and meds. Whew. Damn. That's good. Yeah, I'm very lucky that I can typically get um, about a month's worth of my medications and stuff for about 150 bucks. So, um, and that's after insurance. Um, so I don't even know what it would be without insurance. I don't even want to look that up. So, cause I'm on a slew of meds on a hell of a cocktail of meds. So, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And also I have to do, um, weekly therapist visits as well. Um, so that would be quite expensive. I know without insurance, uh, that would be several hundred dollars per week. So I'd probably be doing just a little over a thousand bucks a month if I didn't have insurance for that. But luckily I do have insurance, which covers that. So, um, and that has been immensely helpful. I feel like everybody should get off my, shoe fly, get off my bread. I feel like everybody should go to therapy. That shouldn't just be something for, your, for folks who have mental health issues. Um, damn, you are persistent. <laughs> that should be uh, standard because it's just, it's very good. Um, help you figure out your issues, problems. What do I need to improve and other stuff like that. So, so two, two hours, 45 minutes later, I'm still eating breakfast. <laughs> but, you know. Yeah. Rough to ma'am. I think that there should, some things, there should be a hard limit on profit margin medication, especially, yeah. Insulin, right? Shoo, get off my laptop. It's so frustrating. So, anger inducing. Oh, God. Yeah, I'm sorry about that, Ocean. <clears throat> So, yeah. All right. Well, now that we're all sad together. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, Ryan, private COVID test. So I will say uh, my, so uh, my first COVID test, the one that I got for, to be positive, I had to pay out of pocket for that because I it needed, I had to go and I had to get a rapid one because it was just like, like I need to figure out uh, like what to do. Like, I need to figure this out quick. So I went and got a, a rapid one done out of network, and that was like 200 bucks. But, you know, what am I going to do? So got to find out if I have it or not. So, um, And then the two I took after to get my negatives to kind of clear me for work and stuff, those were done through L.A. County, Los Angeles County, which luckily Los Angeles County uh, which is, um, I don't know if they still are, but uh, back in January and February, they were still covering the cost of those tests. So that was very nice. So I was definitely appreciative of that. Uh, that was the one, if you ever jump on my Twitter, um, I think around G late January, I made a video of what it looked like uh, taking one of those tests and I literally just shoved that thing all the way up, all the way up into my sinuses and that was, that was an experience. So, 
Yeah, Colton, in 10 years, it's going to be cheaper to transfer your mind to a robot than it will be to pay for some major surgery, hopefully. So, yeah, tell me about it. As we were, we were talking earlier, too, about transhumanism and, and kind of like uploading yourself into robots and other stuff, and that was definitely, uh, uh, yeah, definitely a discussion we had earlier. So you want to catch that one? Once this is on demand, go back and watch it. Yeah, it's good stuff. All right. So, I don't know why I decided to look up at the garage door motor, but I did. <laughs> I can see the fly on the table in front of me. It's just sitting there. Anyways. <laughs> it's my flying impression. <laughs> trying to make you all let's be a little happier so um i have no idea what they're doing when they do that and i also don't want to know um because bugs are gross i don't like bugs they're very they're disgusting so um they freak me out a little bit i saw t i saw too many electron microscope photos of bugs when i was a kid and it just freaks me out just even thinking about it right? so done with done with that so yeah, so don't even tell me what it's doing. Most of the, I just don't want to know. So The fly is waiting for its breakfast. It should go make its own breakfast. The fly should pull itself up by its bootstraps and make its own breakfast. I made this myself. Arr, I made this myself. So, <laughs> which I didn't. So, Oh, I am mocking this fly. So It's actually cleaning itself when it does that. Oh, sure. Sure it is. So... Now it's just sitting there. So, yeah. I'm absolutely disgusted by bugs. Ooh, ah. So, <laughs> yeah. Dumb fly. So, um, for. Hey there. Are you jamming? got to get down there at the 15 after so probably I don't know like 45 I'll, t I'll text you the time oh I don't know I don't know yet so yeah thank you so thank you by the way so always love your mama I said, I said thank you I'm still eating so still going for it I'd handle that. So, taking my dogs to go get haircuts today. They're getting their spa day today. <clears throat> Do I have a dog in here? No? Okay. Yeah, they're... <coughs> <coughs> they're very much in need of haircuts. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Did it go down? My back yet? Internet? My back yet, Internet? My back yet? Internet? Internet, am I back yet? My back yet, Internet? Do you have me? Internet, please respond. So, okay. Hello, computer. Hello, computer. So, um, just seeing, just seeing if I might have gone out there at any point. So I never went away. Okay, on my end, it said I went away, um, but okay, gotcha. So, yeah, my amazing internet that I have here, uh, you know, running at a maximum download of 500 kilobits per second. So, yeah, amazing stuff. Um, no joke, uh, my internet. At its fastest speed, is still slower than the downlink from NASA's Juno spacecraft all the way out of Jupiter. So, amazing. So, but yep, my view over here froze, and then my indicator went yellow. I have a separate 
like a whole like app suite for that. So I actually, so rough demand, uh, isn't LA covered with fiber? Uh, yes and no. Some places are, some places aren't. I live somewhere that some that was in the aren't. Although, <clears throat> although, um, uh, fiber actually was just installed in my neighborhood a couple months ago. So we're getting ready to make the switch. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that. But yeah, fiber. Um, <clears throat> I applied for Starlink. They turned me down. Yep. I got turned down for Starlink. So I see how it is. Just because I don't say nice things all the time about SpaceX, just because I talk about SpaceX from an engineering perspective as opposed to a fanboy perspective. I see how it is. <laughs> no, I was just kidding. Um, but I mean, if I had Starlink, that'd be great. Um, but at the same time, you know, I got turned down. So what am I going to do? Get mad at somebody? Like, just. just <laughs> so, yeah. It's all right. So, um, if, you know what would be really cool is if Starlink goes mo like does mobile stuff, I would totally be all about that. So I would love for my phone to work in the middle of nowhere. Have fun, Phil. Have a good shift. <clears throat> so, um, oh, cool. That's neat. That's neat, Ryan. I like that. So if that network dies, there's another. Uh, so if your network poops, there's another broadband network in to help you out. That's cool. I like that. Yeah, Smokey. I've got mixed feelings on Starlink. Me too. As somebody who does astronomy, <laughs> I've got mixed feelings about it too. Wonder why. Haven't a clue why. <laughs> um, yeah. So. Yeah. I will say though uh, that uh, props to SpaceX uh, because they are SpaceX is actually talking to the astronomical community of and having a dialogue about what they can do in the future to help, you know, help the satellites not interfere um, with with observations and things like that. Um, however, uh, other companies uh, like uh, Blue, like uh, uh, Amazon's Kuiper and OneWeb and others uh, are not having. They're not even talking to anybody so yeah so so props to SpaceX they are trying to put an effort in but at the same time um, this was this by the way I just want to point out this is not something that astronomers just all of a sudden thought about um, as after the first couple of batches of Starlink satellites were launched there are several papers from the late 80s and early 90s that talk about low earth orbit satellite constellations ruining ground-based observational astronomy. So this is not like we're just rolling up on the scene complaining about this. We've known about it for a while. It's just that nobody in the commercial side put in an effort to try to figure out how do we make it low observable, make them low observable or other things like that. So um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's Kobayashi Maru to me because I believe internet is a right, a human right to folks. Um, but I also believe that like an unfettered sky is equally a right as well. So yeah, it's very, it's very difficult for me um, to, to deny access uh, to uh, uh, folks who may not be able to afford a typical internet or be able to have access to typical internet as well. All right, excuse me. Come on, Fly, I'm having a very serious discussion here at the moment, okay? It's leave, be gone, be gone, Fly. So, um, um, yeah, so, yeah, it's complicated, so. Um, also, I'm a little skeptical about Starlink because I haven't heard of any cost reductions happening because the, the whole selling point of Starlink is that it's gonna cost less so, um, and Starlink, as it is now, if I were to, if I had got in and bought into it, um, uh, if I had bought in and gotten into it, 
uh, would have been about $35 more than my current internet provider. So, um, yeah. So, it's weird. It's, and then, yeah, I don't get it. Like, I don't think, I don't think someone in rural Africa is going to be able to afford $99 a month. Um, so, um, also for launching, because the argument is often made that, well, SpaceX can launch telescopes, space telescopes, um, and make them cheap. Well, you really can't make a space telescope cheap because a space telescope is being made for something specific. It's a bespoke instrument. Um, it's not like here on the Earth where you can very easily modify the instruments and change out and other things like that. Your space telescope is designed specifically for the instruments that are going to be flying in it. It is significant it is significantly more custom than any ground-based telescope you will ever make in the history of humanity simply because it is for those instruments that are on board it is not designed to have instruments swapped out like you can here on the ground so unfortunately the idea of launching space telescopes cheaply just really isn't a thing because they aren't because they can't be um if they could be i would love to be proven wrong about this and this is sort of one of those things that I will always say, which is that if I can be, I will be so damn happy if I can be proven wrong about these things. Um, but yeah, Warston, as you say, right there, there's no economy of scale for space telescopes. Um, and that also comes from the fact that you typically aren't operating space telescopes for profit or commercial purposes. Um, that, would, that would be very that would be very crappy if you were doing that. Um, so, um, yeah. I, the idea of a commercial space tel telescope. So the idea of commercial Earth imaging makes sense because people want that data. People who are going to be doing things that will make money with that data. Um, staring at Andromeda and figuring out the distribution of the different classes of stars and then comparing that to what we see here in the Milky Way you don't make money off of that. So why would anybody buy that data? So, yeah, it's kind of it's kind of weird. So Yeah, I don't know. So it's uh I would love to see Oh yeah, rough to man you talk about maybe SpaceX could start mass producing space telescopes. Um that would be really cool if we could figure out how to do that. Like how do we um how like how do we mass produce space telescopes? Um uh, oh, okay, okay, I see where you're coming from, Rough Demand. I'm going to kind of highlight that. So, yeah, so ground, we, t we talked about ground based to kind of go to the second part. If you had a standardized space telescope, you could launch multiple with different instruments. Well, the standardized space telescope um, kind of depends on what you're going to standardize it for. A visible light telescope will have completely different specs from an infrared telescope, um, as would have completely different specs from an ultraviolet telescope. Again, <laughs> they are bespoke, <laughs> so I can't. You can't put an optical telescope and and throw infrared instruments in it or ultraviolet instruments in it and have it work to a degree that you would like it to. Um, so Hubble was able to do that, but at the same time, Hubble was optimized for optical. So even though Hubble did have, uh, even though Hubble does, excuse me, Hubble did. It's still up there and working. So even though Hubble um, did have infrared capability and still has ultraviolet, a little bit of ultraviolet capability, um, it's still not, it is, it is hampered by its, by its design to optimize for optical or visual, which you and I see. Um, so, yeah, yeah, it's not, not quite how it works. Um, so, uh, it's, it's, uh, space telescopes are complicated. <laughs> They're, they're, they're much more complicated than even I thought they were when I started learning about how they operate and, and why you can't stand, why you really can't standardize a space telescope. Um, this fly loves me, so <laughs> I wish I could say the same. So, all right, I guess that's my cue. Should, you know, stop, stop blabbing and keep eating a little bit. Yeah, so. I'm sure SpaceX could launch space telescopes for much cheaper, but yeah, it's just, yeah, yeah, Hubble's, Hubble's optical assembly won't work for, say, like a, like a, 
uh, Spitzer style mission in infrared, or a, or a Fermi style inf- inf- mission in in very high energies like gamma rays and things like that. So, yeah, I, I, you could probably standardize the bus, so the actual bus of the vehicle uh, or the, the the space telescope. You could probably standardize that, but that's about it. That's about it. So, I mean, even with ground-based telescopes, um, a, a infrared telescope on the ground um, won't won't be the same as an as a, a pure infrared telescope on the ground won't be the same as a pure optical telescope on the ground too. So there will be there will be differences because of wavelengths being viewed and other things like that. So um, space telescopes are way more complicated than even I expected them to be. So, so like if these are things that like people don't know about, that's totally cool. Cause it's like, it's all over the place. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> yeah. Yowza. Yeah, I need one of those like salt. Was it the bug assault? The little thing you shoot the, the bug with or thing? I don't know what it's called. But yeah. That would also require me to be, like, comfortable with getting near a bug as well, which I'm not. I really I am. I have a small amount of panic in my body right now. I don't know if you could tell through my voice at times. Um, but especially, I don't know what it is, especially flying bugs. They just do something that, like, really just, I don't know what it is. But it's so funny because I can go out and do backpacking and be perfectly fine with it. So, um <laughs> All right, let's go. Uh, let's run through some more. Uh, running back here, um, but Rufta man, you you bring up some really good points. And actually, I think this would be I think it would be really cool if we could figure out how to do that. Um, if you figure out how to do that, you will make so much money, and you will make astronomers very very happy. Um, and frankly, I would absolutely love to see it love to see it happen um, with that there. So would be nice. Um, so. Get to work. <laughs> Everybody get to work. Have, tell those telescopes to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. Um, all right. So Blake Annenberg, will you want to do a vacation to Starbase for the Starship heavy launch? Um, not for this upcoming one because holy smokes is the Delta variant of COVID going nuts in Texas. I don't want to be near that. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. So no, unfortunately, um, I would love to go, uh, but uh, COVID Delta has given me a great reason not to. So unfortunately, uh, I will watch it um, from the comfort of my mostly virally deficient home, I guess is how I would describe it. So uh, I definitely do want to go see uh, Starship Super Heavy launch at some point, um, just because was it like 16 million pounds of thrust? Holy shit. So. My body is ready. So. The most powerful rocket I've ever seen was a Delta IV Heavy. So I've seen three of them from Vandenberg. So. That was potent. So I can't even imagine what Starship Super Heavy is going to be like. Do we have an official, like, name for it? Like, is it Starship Super Heavy, or is it, like, like, or just, like, Starship Heavy, or Starship, or, or Jefferson Starship, or, like, what are we calling it? So, or should I just pick one, and then let the internet be angry at me for the rest of it? Just like how, um, when I used to do um, the space traffic, which I will do in this upcoming news, um, whenever the Falcon 9, you know, Falcon 9 flips and burns its engines to come back, um, I, I called that a, tur- I still call it, because it is, it's a turn and burn. And people would get very mad at me because, not, not a turn and burn! It's pitching! It's pitching through its axes and then firing its engines. Yeah, it's a turn and burn. Yeah, yeah, turn and burn, right? Turn and burn. So, it's space, direction's relative. So, so, 
I don't want to necessarily say I get like a rise out of annoying people on the internet, but I do. So, <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> Rough to man, I like that. Yeah, let's get a let's get a crude observatory on the back side of the moon. Actually, um, that is one of those things that NASA is looking at doing a, a uh, radio observatory on the uh, far side of the moon. So I love it. Uh, get out of here! Come on! Stop it! Stop flying so fast! Calm yourself. So no, Ryan, it turns and burns. <laughs> So the day I die, it will be a turn and burn. And you know it's great. Starship? Super heavy? It's gonna turn and burn. And New Glenn? When it flies? In the 23rd century, finally? Its first stage is gonna turn and burn. Neutron? Neutron's first stage? Oh, great. Now I've got multiple flies in here. Great. What's that say about me? When neutron flies, it's going to turn and burn. So. <laughs> uh, here's a good one from Warston. What are your thoughts on Kessler syndrome? And do you think anyone or a company has positioned themselves to have a real chance of tackling that problem? Um, so Kessler syndrome is going to become an actual, I mean, if it isn't already a tangible issue, um, it will be very shortly. Uh, Starlink alone is gonna be 30,000 satellites, right? In orbit, that's a lot of stuff. Um, and like, you better hope that as many of those satellites function as much as they can because sure the, I've heard the argument that you know oh you know if a Starlink satellite goes out if it stops functioning it's only like it only takes four to t four to five years for it to, to deorbit naturally and four to five years is still four to five years you know that's every every single moment that you're in orbit you're out of control and you can potentially collide with something and cause even bigger problems so now I've got gnats in here. Great. So they should just eat my food and do that. So, but, um, Leo Labs, I know, is working on some really good space base or, uh, space radars, ground-based space radar, to try to help with tracking. And I know the U.S. Space Force. Right in my face. Thanks for that. And I know the U.S. Space Force is uh, pushing as well to uh, uh, actually do something. I mean, um, to start tra helping track things on orbit. So, so yeah. Well, oh, there's really not a lot, unfortunately. Uh, Blake Annenberg. That's a good question. Uh, has the wildfire smoke affected astro astronomy observations? Um, I would imagine it has um, in areas like the Pacific Northwest and the, the uh, northern Midwest of the United States and other places around them. Um, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, if you've, if you've got smoke, you have to close everything up. So. So, yeah. <laughs> I know, it's like all of a sudden my answers got really short. <laughs> um, yeah, at least at least down here in L.A., uh, we, I don't think we had any wildfire smoke yet from this season. Um, it's definitely not like how it was last year where it was like, looked like the Las Vegas scenes from Blade Runner 2049. So... Yeah, we haven't gotten that bad yet. I'm not 
positive for a, a good fall because it was really we had a really dry year here in in uh, California and really the the West Coast as a whole because um, climate change so yeah really sucks so yeah Smokey about your travel plans to LA yeah it's 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 a knife edge um, it's even I will admit it is even starting to pick up here in Los Angeles even with us masking up and taking precautions above and beyond it is it is it's starting to accelerate everywhere unfortunately so oh nice after ma'am you saw a launch when you're in the US Minotaur 4 I have never seen one of those. It's a small, it's a solid rocket. Remember, right? So it's going to be fast, fast and loud. Yep. Yep, Blake. Turn and burn. Put it on a t-shirt. I'll endorse it. Hold on, somebody said something. <laughs> Smoky. <laughs> uh, Ryan, it rotates to a particular relative angle and then relights its Merlin 1D engines, is what I think you meant to say. Yes, does it turn and burn? And Colton says we need a new name for the belly flop. Yes, turn and burn. <laughs> Although it performs the turn and burn. Thanks to its, uh, what did we, what did I end up calling them? Because somebody was like, they're not aero, those, those wings aren't aerodynamic devices, they're flaps. And it's like, well, do you know what flaps are? <laughs> they're aerod aerodynamic devices. So. And I think I reached like a joke compromise. What did I call them? It was like flap, flap break of or something like that. So, like, it used its flap break of to stabilize itself. You know, flap break of <clears throat> Or break uh, flap maybe? I don't know. I'm trying to figure out what's, what's the silliest sounding combination of breaks, flaps, and elevons. <laughs> it's, it's an elevon, so I'll figure it out later. <clears throat> Yeah, Smokey, I don't disagree. Multiple flies means, <coughs> <coughs> means you have a big, stinky brain. So it's true. I do have a big, stinky brain. I don't know about big, but it stinks. So, um, <coughs> uh, Oh, Smokey, yeah, that's a very good one. So we had to develop, uh, so we need to develop a satellite hunter deorbiter system. Yeah, something like that. Just shoot them out of the sky. So, uh, we have a good one here from Rough Demand, <clears throat> which is as a hobbity, uh, hobbity, as a hobby rocketeer, it's been a few hours. As a hobby rocketeer, what do you think about the non foldable grid fins on the Starship booster? Um, definitely uh, not surprising, I would imagine. Um, you still need to have control authority, and with something as big as is uh super heavy is it's going to need um it's going to need a little bit more than just gimbal so um and if i remember correctly <laughs> these flies are killing me here today i swear um gonna need a little bit more control authority than just gimbal is going to be able to provide you so it definitely needs it. So, <clears throat> um, I have not watched. So talking about the grid fins, not folding. Have you watched the everyday astronaut video interviewing Elon? Um, I have not watched it all the way through yet. Um, it's always hard for me to watch Elon talk because he's not the best public speaker. But 
you you always do learn some great stuff from when he's doing t- talks t- technical talks. Um, so I gotta I gotta watch those um, all the way through and work on that. So uh, yeah. So Blake, thanks Jared for the Q and the QA. I'm still going. So I. I think I am going to make a move indoors here because I'm about to wrap up eating and then also I kind of want to get out of the flies. I don't know who put a hex upon me, but now they're landing on me. So, my God. Okay, screw this. I'm taking a break. (laughs) All right, everybody. Let's take a break. I'll see you all in a second. Make sure I mute this so you don't hear me, like, make fart noises or other stuff. How do I mute this? Uh, I think I'll just be on uh, about, let's just take a little break for like five minutes uh, or a little bit longer. I'll be back at 1230. So I'll be in just about seven, eight minutes. Okay. So see you then. Um, um, I don't know. Uh, Entertain yourself. Somehow put on uh, Super Stupid by Funkadelic. That's definitely a good song for this morning. So go for it.
have returned. <laughs> Oops, that was my fan that I have right here. It's toasty. It's really toasty. Just letting you, just, I mean, just reminding you, you know, I wasn't farting. I wasn't farting. I was just doing that. So, it's toast. Man, I'm like burning up right now. So, I think I need my other, I need my, okay, it's enough for that. I need my big fan on, I'm sorry. All right, just let me know if my big fan, I have my big fan on now, so let me know if that's just too much, too much background noise for that there, so. <clears throat> How's that sounding, everybody? Can you get it? All going good? <clears throat> All right. Not the flies. Not the bees. Not the bees. You know. Um, I can always aim that a little bit, try to aim the sound a little bit there. It's just, I just mean, it's like, it's, you know, it ain't hot today, but it's humid. Um, it's really been, this has been a weird summer, because it's just like, LA has like switched over to humidity for some reason. Not digging it. Yeah. Not at all. I'm not a humidity person, because I've just never lived in humidity before. Hey! Y'all want to say, should I say hi? Hey, come here. I got bacon. Puppies. Suki. Missy. Come here. I got some bacon. Would you like to make an appearance? If I give you some bacon, will you make an appearance? You want to come on up here? Would you, would you like some bacon as payment? <laughs> she sat down and she's staring at me. Okay, come here. Come here, honey. Come here, sweetie. Come on. Come on. No, no, no. I don't know where you're going. No, stop. Back here. Come here. Ow! Da -da -da -da, da -da 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 -da. Hi, Missy. Say hi. Say hi. Hello. Hello. Look at how fuzzy I am. She's so fuzzy. She is so fuzzy. That's why you're going and getting a haircut today. Oh, you stinky. Oh, big stinky. You such a stinky big. <laughs> that was a burp if I've ever seen it. <laughs> okay, hold on. Just to show the world that I did pay you, it's bacon. Dumbass. <laughs> so dumb, but I love you. <laughs> Chew with your mouth closed. Where are your manners? Okay. I'm going to get you off of me before you cut apart. Uh, come here, Sook. Come here, Sookie. Sookie. Come here, Sookie. Come here, Alright everybody, well, I'm glad that like half of my audience died right in the middle of my break, so, so this is why they're gone. But hello to all of you who've stuck around. We're still going here. We are still going. That's what's up. Just enjoying myself. Enjoying this now delightful afternoon with all of you. Holy moly. Oh. <sighs> Man. How's everybody doing? Roll call. Who's in? <clears throat> Ooh, 
who's in? Can't you hear me knocking? So, sorry about that. Um. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Oh boy. Oh, all right. Yeah. Smokey. Smokey. Smokey's here. Barkston's in the house. We still got a good uh Got a good question for Warston I'll get to in a second. Colton's here. Ryan's here. Missy's here. I'm here. So there's at least a couple people. A couple people watching at the moment. Let me let me fire off this tweet before I answer that for you, Warston. That's a really good question. Really, really nice physics question. So um, which in a roundabout way, um, I'm, I'm, so I'll give you the quick answer. Um, that yes and no. So <laughs> Uh, e yeah, it, you can account for it, and it adds a little oomph, but no, it doesn't count towards orbital velocity, I guess is how I would describe it. Or does it really count towards it? We'll get to it in a second. So I'll try to explain it as best I can, too. Gosh, a seasonal blue moon this morning. Now, what are you... People are doing everything they can in order to make the moon oh goodness All right. the moon's pretty cool you don't have to already make it more special than it already is I guess that's what I'm trying to say uh -huh. Give me just a second. Gotta fire that off. Gotta fire that off. Marston asking some big questions here. So if the Earth spins at roughly 1,670 kilometers per hour, is that accounted for when calculating the need to get to roughly 2,800 kilometers per hour when going to orbit? In other words, should we tack on an additional 16 or 1,670 to the speed advertised? Holy smokes, Morriston, that is a hell of a physics problem. Um, well, one of the things that you can do with that is momentum, the inertia, which allows you to carry a little bit more if you're at the equator. Um, so that's why you'll find you know, folks like, like you know, here in the United States, Cape Canaveral and Vandenberg are as close to the equator as we can possibly get them while still being on, I guess what would you call it, like mainland of the United States. And uh, and then groups like Orion Space literally built their their launch site on the equator to increase the ability to lift a mass or lift more mass with the same rocket. And then Sea Launch does that as well, where they would you know take a rocket from I think it was Long Beach here actually and go down to the equator and launch it from there to get a little more payload out of it. But I don't think... I 
don't think in terms of velocity it would add on because it's relative. Um, so regardless of where you're starting, you start at zero velocity relative to what you need for orbit. That's a really good question, Warston. I actually don't know. So, <laughs> just super good one. I legitimately don't know. Wow, I'm stumped. I really am. That's a good one. I don't know. And I don't want to... <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm having a little snack. <laughs> I just finished breakfast, so now it's time for a snack. Um, yeah, and I don't want to... I want to give a wrong answer on that either, so I don't know. So, I don't know. Maybe I could look it up somewhere. Earth's rotation count towards orbital velocity. I'm going to say no, just because... cheese by the way some good cheese Apparently you can for rockets. Okay, hold on a second. Okay, so apparently dump Jared and then Jared's going to hunt down for everything he can find <laughs> to answer this question. Forget everything else.
Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I, so I, I found something because, like, I found somebody, like, a group attempting to answer it. But everybody's like, no, you're wrong. Here's how it actually is. But it's like 30 of those in a row. So <laughs> I'll have to... <laughs> I'll have to go crack open a physics textbook in just a little bit, but but my gut instinct is to say that we're working with frames of reference. So we're working with a frame of reference here on the Earth. So that means I mean imagine that that should mean that that it shouldn't you shouldn't catch. Any extra? This is hard. Marston, you asked me a hard one. So, <laughs> uh, but I'll definitely. I, I want to get back to you on that. Now I'm going to hunt for that. So at our, uh, the AMA, the ask me almost anything in a couple weeks. You better be there, Marston. I'm going to have an answer for you. So, so, holy smokes, that was a good one. Yeah, um, I want to. I kind of want to second this too. Which is, I don't know is a really good answer. I just like it when people make crap up. Uh, true. Yeah, I'm not going to try to make up anything on this. I don't. I don't. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's how that goes. That's, yeah, that's a tough one. That's a good one, Morris. Then I'm going to hunt that down now because it's a really, it's just a really neat question um, with that there. So, um, but I would imagine, so I imagine for the, uh, the, so the ability to lift a payload with increased mass, yes. Um, it does work as opposed to the overall velocity of a rocket. Um, I don't know. I would assume that it starts at zero relative speed because your your frame of reference, if you will, is the Earth itself. Then you're not m moving at really a velocity relative to the Earth. Um, it's only when you start to. It's only when you ignite your engines and you start burning propellant and you start moving that you would then your velocity would then begin to actually gain and then even then it's still relative to the earth itself so huh interesting um because the earth will still rotate underneath you and yeah interesting that's really cool so uh yeah atmosphere uh definitely so the atmosphere you're mostly going to be taking into account because of drag and things like that and that's that's of course why rockets will initially start vertical and then then do their pitch over or their gravity turn, or whatever you feel like calling it, their turn and burn, um, with that there. So, um, also, if you don't mind, I'm I'm dearly sorry. Uh, this is, it is currently time. Uh, it is the midpoint of my day, uh, so I have to take, um, take my regiment here. I don't know how easy this is to see, uh, but yeah, this is this is me. This is what I. Uh, let me see. Okay. <laughs> I have to wait a couple seconds to catch the delay here with it. So, yeah, that's me. That's me right there. Quite a bit. So, um, you know, and so it goes. So, got to take this real quick. Um, you know, if, uh, if you can't make your own happiness, store-bought is just fine. That's a lot of pills. Oh yeah, tell me about it. So, but you know, it. Um... <laughs> By the way, that's my afternoon. In case you wanted to know, that's not my morning pills, which I already took this morning, or, or if you want to see my evening. There you go. There's my evening. Evening pills. So, yeah. <laughs> so just in case, just in case you're ever thinking about taking up being bipolar as a hobby, um, highly recommend, highly recommend uh, <laughs> that you consider um, you consider not doing it so uh, just from the pills alone how many pills do I take a day a lot uh, god when is that well this is what right now this is one two three four five six seven eight nine for the afternoon 
and then for the morning it is 6, and then for the evening, so that's 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, baby. 24 pills throughout my day. One for every hour. So, some of these I take once a day, some of these I take twice a day. There's one of them I take three times a day, so three times. All right, so here we go. I'm going to go ahead and turn the sound down so you don't have to hear me because I don't know what it is. So if I try to take pills, well, like most people do, where they throw them in their mouth and then they drink some water, I choke. Um, and I've just never been able to do it correctly. Um, but so I, I throw them in while I'm dry and then go for it. But that also makes me choke sometimes. So you probably don't want to hear me do that. But I'm just going to go ahead and take them on air because this is who I am. Take a little bit of a breather. <laughs> a little breather there. Yeah. Oh yeah, store bought happiness. That's what I always do. I always love to say that. I always love that. If you can't if you can't make your own happiness, store bought is just fine. Um oh, and uh yeah, it's pretty great. Um yeah, it's it's if I didn't have health insurance it would be very expensive. Um, even with health insurance, like I was saying earlier, it's about 150 bucks a month for me. So, so I don't even want to think about what it would be without health insurance. So, um, but if, if I had a choice, <laughs> Colton, Maybe you can mush them into some cheese like Heidi pills for dogs to eat. Actually, my dog Missy, who made the appearance earlier, she has um, something with her salivary glands where she has to have pills twice a day, and we do we do put it in a piece of cheese for her. So she loves her love she loves her little snack. And what's great is that my mom, um, like a year ago, uh, did a really bad job at putting the pills in a piece of cheese. So now my mom can't give her her pills because my Missy knows that if my mom tries to give her cheese, there's pills in it. So, um, but if I give her cheese, there's there's no pills in it. So, um, but yeah, that's pretty good. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, my mom betrayed her. Betrayal. Um, I wish I could buy happiness. I like in stores here. That's true. So, yeah, Ryan, Missy is Missy smart. Yeah, she is. She's she's a frighteningly smart dog. So, um, she'll she'll lead me to things. So, she knows that if she leads me to things, I'll I'll know what she wants. So, she's very manipulative. She's very good at at sitting there. Just making noises that make her look cuter than she is. And then, like, that's, that convinces me to, to you know, take her, take her and do, do things that she otherwise wouldn't, wouldn't really be able to get away with. So, so, yeah, if you guys, if you ever, uh, if you ever look on my Twitter feed, at Jared Head, um, I always put videos of her and, and Asuki, my other dog, um, on there, and she's just, she's a rascal. They're both rascals, but, you know, in their own certain ways, so. Um, okay, I'm going to keep going. I only got five to go, um, so halfway, halfway, almost halfway there. Oh, Warriston, labs are good for that, finding trash cans.
done. So now I am medicated. <clears throat> and then just one more thing, a little, little some vitamins, some vitamins here. Get some some vitamins in me. The gummies. But it's for adults. See? Adult. But they're gummies. So they're good. I like it. <laughs> yep, down the hatch. Down they go. You're good, Warston. So yeah, if it, if it was um, so yeah, 24 pills a day. But if it's if it's um, a choice between uh, the psychosis or the stability, I'll I'll take the stability. So I really like the stability. It like it's it's nice. I mean, like I'm clinically nuts. I am. When people are like, you're crazy. I'm like, yes, I know. I am. So, um, oh, you didn't see CBD? <laughs> I mean, you know, fair enough. So, uh, these, however, so, you know, they do partake. So, <clears throat> so, <laughs> those are the adult gummies. Those are like the adult gummies for grown up kids. So. <laughs> um, I was at, uh, I guess, <clears throat> some. some yeah, Colton's on his way. Um, uh, gosh, what, what, when was it? So, 2017, I went to uh, Midwest Fur Fest, which is the largest furry convention in the world. Over 10,000 people. A lot of people, um, and I ended up uh, accidentally having a god. What was it? Like a seventy-five milligram edible, like straight up, um, with no prep or anything like that. And that just knocked me out. So that was that was wow. You know, you know, uh, was it? Is it from Dumbo? Elephants and woozles are very confusing. It was. Yeah, it was pretty, it was, it was, I gotta say, a furry convention, um, on, like, powerful edibles is something else. I eventually reached a point where I was on the floor in my friend's hotel room, and I just, like, I just couldn't get up, because I was on the floor, and everything was moving too fast, and I just couldn't really stand. Um, so I just laid down on the floor, and I kind of waited until... The, I stopped feeling the rotation of the Earth, which maybe I can answer your, your question um, with some studies with that, Warston. Um, I'll have to take some edibles to answer your question about rockets with that. Um, could help me. Um, but uh, my friend returned to the hotel room and uh, was like, oh, man, what are, you, what are you doing on the floor? I know, but no, he came back into the hotel room and was like, what are you doing? What are you doing there? And I was like, I, I can't really stand up because the Earth's spinning really fast. He's like, well, of course you can't stand up, especially when you're on the ceiling like that. It's just like, oh, oh, now I'm on the floor. What are you talking about? So, so that was pretty funny. Uh, I got to say. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, and then. Um, uh, 2019 at Further Confusion, which is the furry convention here in California. Uh, got some cookies. They were good. They were really good cookies. So, Big big Pete's Treats, I think that's what it's called. So, um, I'm very much a, when it comes to imbibing the devil's lettuce, uh, I am very much a sativa person as opposed to indica. Um, if you don't know the differences, really nice way to kind of uh, uh, kind of explain the differences between the two. Uh, indica is what most people, in, indica provides what most people think of when they think about um, in, uh, using cannabis. Um, 
So that sort of uh, like how to describe it, uh, like really nice and relaxed and uh, like man, I could I could use like, like I could use a small box truck of Oreos right now, and uh, I don't really care for indica. Like I'll have some, but it also leads to something that I like to call couch lock, um, and I'm not really big on that. So I'd rather just like get on with it, you know. Um, and then there's sativa, which is the one I prefer, um, which allows uh, uh, kind of, I don't want to say it peps you up, but it definitely helps you like focus and think very creatively and other things like that. Not to say indica doesn't, but indica slows you down while doing that. Sativa kind of just enhances, kind of feels like it enhances uh, that. So uh, yeah, so it was really fun. Good times. And of course, you know, uh, yeah, <laughs> bless California uh, with, our, with our understanding that, you know, uh, um, yeah, you think it's not bad for you at all, especially if you do it edible style, so instead of smoking it. So, uh, but I think uh, I think we're coming to a close here, so I think we're wrapping up. Um, so, yeah, I kind of I kind of feel like we're just wrapping up right now. So, uh, so you know, I figure the next one, I'm not sure when it's going to be. It'll definitely be in September uh, by that time. But just keep an eye on the account here and just. Uh, Make sure you're subscribed and other things like that, and you'll be seeing it coming up pretty soon here. So um, so thanks, everybody, for stopping by today. It was really fun chatting with all of y'all and uh, looking forward to the next one that we get to do, and hopefully we can talk about some other cool things, and everyone uh, will be coming on board. And Colton will be 33, and Colton, I'll be right behind you there uh, shortly in October uh, coming up. So... Be seeing y'all in a couple weeks. Thank y'all so much for coming and watching and hanging out for a little bit. And until then, keep exploring.